Yes, and uh, it's time for Court Today with Muta Lainusa. Good morning. Yeah, I, I always have authentic <laughs> men. Yeah, 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 of yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. With us, you, 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 you are some bunny po. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take you to authentic, okay? I, I, authentic am, yearn, I am yearning yes, for that I meeting. I think we, we need to I am definitely to, yearning. She needs, to, she, she yes. needs to be you, you authenticated and authenticated. You should, you should yes. hear authentic talk to you. Wow. Just talk to you. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> it needs to be authenticated and, and authenticated. authenticated. <laughs> That's right. So, of course, you know that my suit was provided by Authentic. Mm -hmm. So, like I always tell you, call Authentic on 0243 0294. Nine four. Nine four. That's right. <laughs> 0243 And Authentic will sort you out yes. with a nice outfit, like, you know, what I'm wearing. Do you know the color of the suit I'm wearing? Tell me the color. Can't you see? What's the color? Tell us the color. <laughs> <laughs> it's not time for today. <laughs> All right, Captain. Take us away. Let's get into the issues. Yes. Um, let's begin with uh, what happened in yesterday. court yesterday. So quite a, a number of interesting cases mm -hmm. in court yes. that we've always been talking about. Um, sexy Dondo was in court yes. yesterday. yesterday uh, what happened? Yesterday uh, the JB, the JB sexy, sexy Dondo case. There. Initially, the case was scheduled for the afternoon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, we know what is happening. The jurors say, yes. 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 Mm -hmm. So now, you, sometimes you see some of them around. They're having fans around. They say they don't have, they they don't have money to come to go. Sometimes ah, they're there. <laughs> really? Yeah, they right, that, you know, you know, that, that is the painful part. Yes. Like you can see your yes, workers. Yes, they will not come yes, to work. Yes, yeah, they are around. Because they have not paid them. Yeah, they are around. They said mm -hmm. until they are paid the allowances, mm -hmm. they, they are not coming. Ah, well, so so they, yesterday, yeah, that yeah. case was forced into adjournment before mm -hmm. Justice Lydia or Sam mm -hmm. What the court indicated was to the fact that the court is hoping that by June 10th, Everything will be resolved, and then the jurors will be back to post for this case to happen. Yesterday, we were expecting Daniel Asie, the sexy Dondon, to continue with his uh, testimony. You know, he's given mounting defense and he's given his evidence in chief already on two occasions, two different sittings he has spoken, and we expect him to 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 do uh, continue. The lawyers say they will need at least two and a half sittings to be able to tell their story and then also confirm some of the things that prosecution witnesses have come to court to see. So um, when they are done, the state prosecutors led by uh, Mrs. Sefa Kobache, who a principal state attorney, will cross-examine him. Then that will be it. He has not indicated of calling any witness uh, so far. So when that is done, then the court will have to uh, fix a date and then ask the lawyers to file addresses closing addresses, a time will be given for the, them to come and orally address the jury, then the court will sum up the trial for the jury to decide mm. or come out with their verdict. So, sexy London yesterday, it has an agenda to June 10th. Okay. 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 Mm -hmm. Cocoa board case, uh, yes. fourth uh, defense witness is still in the box. Yes, yeah, still in the box, giving evidence now. He's been subjected to cross examination. He's done with his evidence in chief mm. that when he was led by uh, Benson Nichupi, counsel for Seidu Agongo and Agricult Ghana Limited, second and third accused. So now he's facing cross examination from lawyers of Dr. Stephen Kononokuni, led by lawyer Samuel Kojo. And then after, prosecution will take their turn to also subject him to cross examination before justice. Abu Ajitando. So that's what happened in relation to the Kuku board case. Mm -hmm. The last time we spoke about the Beige Bank case, mm -hmm. the seventh defense witness yes. was giving his testimony. Yes. Uh, is he still giving his testimony? So yesterday they called the seventh. Mm -hmm. Yes. So um, she came to court testifying. But he was a former uh, chief finance officer of DYA. Mm. Uh, a subsidiary under the bench group. Uh, group. Yes, yesterday he came to court, and her testimony was in relation to some six million Ghana cities, which was transferred from First Atlantic Savings and Loan to DYI. Mm -hmm. And he, she is saying that look, she has provided how that particular money was invested, was utilized by DYI for its operations, mm -hmm. and all the uh, monies where how it was disbursed and all that. She said that. Not a city was credited to Michael Nineko.
So mm. you cannot say he stole that particular man. Yeah. Yeah. That was that was all his testimony was. So all allegations that Mr. Nineku stole that particular, you know, the charges are about forty three of them. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so he's calling witness in relation to all the house absolutely. So all the monies that were 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 said to have been transferred to uh, sister companies, they are calling witnesses who have knowledge on them to come and testify. So yesterday's testimony was in relation to some six million that was transferred from First Atlantic. First African Savings and Loan to the DY, which the chief finance officer was in court to say that I have documents, I have shown you proof of how all the dismissments were made, and not a single went coin to went to my own. So, you are supposed to continue tomorrow, but tomorrow something very interesting is happening. There is a uh, new enrollment of lawyers. Okay, okay. And Justice Ifia Sewa Sarabuti is in there. Some of her, her, her students ah. will also be called to the bar. So, tomorrow she has to be there. So, and 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 today, Ama. yes, Ama governor. our governor will be yeah. there tomorrow. We'll have an engagement with Amma. <laughs> we'll see what happens. <laughs> the new okay. girlfriend will have Absolutely, yes. yes. <laughs> Whether you like it or not. The one I don't know from Adam. <laughs> yeah, and now you know. Yes, now, now you know. Now you know. Yes, sir. After her moment tomorrow. Yes, we yes, definitely yeah. will have a, we'll have a word with her. You have to come and, 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 and lend support, moral support. Yes. Why right, people be mischievous? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, you didn't know to know somebody to offer moral support. Absolutely. You can like people from afar. You are being mischievous this morning. No, I'm just being frank. Yes, come around. Frank about it. Because you are, you are well authentic, yeah. come and, and come and offer introduce support. authentic to her. Yeah. Know, you never know. You're wearing a yeah. lot of yeah. suits yeah. and all that. Mm. Let's just look at the ambulance <laughs> case, uh, which is, which is uh, taking over all the headlines yes. in the country. Yeah. <laughs> the controversy is still not down. Uh, that yet is still around. Mm -hmm. uh, Deputy Attorney General Alfred, Alfred Chiayebua has been mm -hmm. uh, giving some more updates in relation to that. You notice that when the incident campaign happened, there's a lot of calls for the Attorney General to resign, resign step yes. down. Yes. He's not in the country as we speak. But the Attorney General is saying that, look, the Deputy AG, yeah, yeah. the man is still uh, doing what he's supposed to do. He's resolute. But he's saying that, look, our case in court is what we are doing. Whatever is happening outside, it doesn't affect the substance of the case. We'll go to court, fight the case the way we have to file it. At first, as we speak, uh, prosecution have closed their case. Dr. Atul Forsen has also closed his case. And Mr. Richard Jakba is now in the witness board. Let's hear from Deputy Attorney General Alfred Jayabwa yesterday when he spoke to journalists. The Attorney General is very visible, very firm, very healthy. And I think his duties to the Attorney General is currently out of conviction and very soon to be back to continue his duties as the Attorney General. We are in court. And in the case of this nature, our court, we have closed our case in that matter. The first accused person has closed his case. The, second, the third accused person is in the witness stand and that was where the That's where our the NDC wants him to. The audios have, if there are any, have nothing to do with what we are doing in court. And the judge yesterday made it known to all of us that what we are doing in court from what we are doing in the public space, that's political. Our focus is to do what we are supposed to do in court for it to get to the end of this matter. It is not in doubt. We issued a statement within the week. You've heard our spokesperson very true. Circumstance that led to that kind of conversation. And then we think nothing untoward was said as, as I speak now. Right, so that's the yes. deputy AG Alfred Chan was yes. speaking. So Says he's the attorney update. general is very fine, he's very resolute, healing and hearty. Absolutely, he's healing, he's he will not resign today. You know, he is our lawyer. Yes, yes, he's the country's the state, lawyer. All of us, the state's yeah. lawyer. So, if you have any issue in relation to crime, it is the attorney general yeah. who will have to give you one of uh, his lawyers, the lawyers at his office, to go to court. And you become a complainant and witness in the, uh, in the in this whole matter. So he said he's resolute. And is ready to fight. Once he's back in the country, we'll see him in court. Mm. Yes. Okay, we'll be waiting for him. Absolutely. Uh, fervently, with, with bated breath. Yeah, <laughs> we are waiting for the attorney general. And, and for, for, for those who know the attorney general, he's the man for the court. He loves the actions in court. Ah. Yeah, he does. Mm. Love the actions. So let's uh, talk about the cases that are coming up in yeah, court yeah, today. Yeah. Yes. Um, These two men. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
Samuel Ofosuampofu, yeah, the, the former NDC. national chairman of the NDC, and Anthony Kweku Bwain, mm. a former communications of, deputy communications officer. Today, they are in court in relation to some uh, leaked audio tape that came up that they allegedly were plotting to, as it were, assault the chairman of the Peace Council and then the chairperson of the Electoral Commission. This case has been called, prosecution called three witnesses. They close their case now. It is the turn of the accused persons to open their defense because the court held that a prima facie evidence has been, has been established. Mm. So we've been fought and back at the last few sittings now for close to about a year. Uh, Samuel of Usman uh, is not well. He has been out of town on medic to have some medical procedures and all that. At the last court sitting on April 25, Justice Samuel Isidu, currently a justice of the Supreme Court, said that, look, if Samuel of Usman Pofu is unable to come, then Anthony Kwekubwain mm -hmm. should be ready today to mount the witness box to open his defense. Yes, yeah. But the news that we are picking, at the last time, Hanan was at the airport when Samuel of Usman Pofu arrived. Oh, yeah, and so, country. yes. So currently, as we do know, he is back in the country, and we expect that he will be in court today. And mm -hmm. today, the expectation is that he will he mount will the witness box his and defense. open his defense. Okay. So that is what we are expecting in relation to this one. If what Justice uh, Samuel Esiedu said is anything to go by, mm -hmm. then today we should say because Samuel of us is back. If for any reason he's not in court today, then Anthony Kwekubwa will, will, will have to. The lawyers raised an issue that if you look at the charges pressed against Kwekubwa, Anthony uh, Samuel of Usampo will have to speak before mm. him because he is only an attachment, mm. more like a conspiracy and all that. Mm. But the court is saying, come and stay your side of the story. The case is taking too much delay and the court wants to wash its hands of it. So mm. that is what we expect in relation to this very case. Mm. Okay. And then the final one coming up today is the Senate OBS case. Yes, mm -hmm. if that case is still ongoing. Ten mm. prosecution witness, investigator mm. is in the witness box. And then as mm. we speak, he has finished his evidence in chief, what he wants to tell the court, document, exhibit, that interaction that he had with all the five accused persons. He has mm -hmm. put all before Justice Henry and Tony Kofi, also uh, Justice of the Supreme Court. So we lawyers of um, Ernest Thompson mm -hmm. have started the cross-examination, and today we expect that they will continue that. And the lawyer doing that is lawyer Samuel Kudu. He's the same person who is also leading Dr. Stephen Gobno. So okay. that's what we expect to coming up today. All right. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you today. As always. As always. <laughs> See ya. We'll, we'll catch you on the flip As side. Well. That's it for court today. Let's take a look at today's papers. We begin with the daily graphic, more cancer treatment centers needed. That's according to an oncologist. Ghana card as sole identification. Political parties give EC green light to lay new bill. Uh, government votes $700 million for book research allowances since 2020. I review Labor Act to protect workers. The flag bearer of the NPP is assuring the TUC. Uh, on the Daily Guide, live telecast for anti-gay bill cases. Uh, three caged over alleged sextortion. Baumia message good. That's according to the TUC. And KGL boss is overall best CEO. And NEIP initiative transforms entrepreneurship. That's according to Nanado Danko Kupado. And now to the Ghanaian Times. NEIP creates 103,000 871 jobs from 2017 to 2023. That's according to President Tukufado. First batch of pilgrims from Tamale arrive in Jeddah, 184 on death row in Ghana. This is according to Amnesty International report. Ghana is set to become first African country to establish small modular reactor. That's it for the Ghanaian Times. On the Chronicle, uh, the Bible verses from Proverbs 12, 20. Deceit is in the heart of those who plot evil. Mm. But those who promote peace... 
Have joy. Have joy. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. A mm -hmm. those government wants to imprison Atoforsen <laughs> for unjust reason. That's according to General Mosquito. Mohammed's name pops up in AG Dami Tip Saga. Indeed, former President Mohammed specifically maintained the discontinuance of the ambulance trial as a condition to get members of the minority in Parliament to agree to the recent recall of Parliament. That's according to Frank Davis. That's what he's saying. Is it true? Well, that's what he said. Um, Angela List uh, named Angela List named female CEO of the year in mining, and KON directs contractors to observe a safety protocol. So that's the chronicle. Let's move to the Daily Dispatch. It says the Akufando government has not spent recklessly. They have used funds well. And that's according to the flag bearer of the NPP, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia. NDPC launches Ghana's Vision 2057. Dr. Abdul Hamid Anad for exemplary leadership. Uh, Dr. Sam Ankara. Okay. Uh, his alternative force for action. Okay, on the searchlight, uh, sinking Ghana City, Mahama campaign team admits they do not have a solution, have they? And PPNDC in desperate misbehavior over Atto Forsen's fate and a host of other stories that you can check out on the Daily Searchlight newspaper. So that's it for the newspapers. We are back with a breakfast review shortly. Do stay tuned in. Welcome back to GH Today here on GH1 TV. It's time for the breakfast review segment. And my guests are seated here in the studio. And I'll be introducing my guests to you. We've got quite a lot to talk about. Uh, there are still a lot of calls for the Attorney General to step aside because he's been accused by Richard Jakpa of trying to coerce him to testify against Cassiel out of Forsen, and that has become the talk of town. And there are calls coming from all quarters for the Attorney General to step aside for there to be uh, a public inquiry into the conduct of the Attorney General, among other things. But is that the way to go? Uh, the Deputy Attorney General says the Attorney General is out of the country, but he's healed and hearty, and he knows he's not done anything uh, untoward. So we'll talk about that here on the show today, of course. Uh, we also uh, want to know what is happening with the Pualugu Dam and the monies that have been paid? Uh, some, some, some individuals have been rendering account for the monies that, has been, that have been paid for the Pualugu Dam, but a minority are insisting that uh, there needs to be better and further particulars in that regard. So we'll talk about that as well, of course, among other things, uh, with our guests on the Breakfast Review. Welcome back to the show. So, my guests in the studio this morning, um, Bernard Mona is here. He is flag bearer aspirant, or should I say presidential aspirant uh, for this year's election. And uh, he's joined us here in the studio. He's a member of the People's National Convention. We're always happy to have him on a Thursday here at GH1 TV. Good morning. Morning, sir. How are we doing today? Um, we are okay. Just that you wake up every day to numerous scandals and you've been hoping that one day you get up and then there's no scandal. But <coughs> the government of President Nana Akufadu is like scandals has become the second anthem of his government. So every day you have to sink one scandal upon the other. I get terrified by the volumes of scandals we are getting and in the end it is we largely the majority of Ghanaians who suffer from these scandals from state capture to stealing our wealth and starching monies under the abets causing inflation and above all to the huge lies that they continue to 
Pedalaran. The poor people of Northeast and Upper East region have been rendered very, very sadly so by the fact that the biggest project that this government claimed to have done is the Pualugu Dam. And when you go to the ground, antelopes and wild animals are well, growing there. We'll get into it. This was and just so, to introduce so you. For me, we'll, we'll get into those issues. I feel very... We'll get into those issues. Wheezy. You feel I, what? Wheezy? Wheezy every morning. I don't, I, don't, I don't know what that means, but <laughs> no. thank you, Bernard Bonner, for joining us you in the You didn't attend Tamasco, so you don't understand. Ah, uh, well, I did not. I did not. Uh, but many of my uncles and aunties did. So, so you have to learn from them. Okay. Uh, also in the studio is the Deputy Minister for Sanitation and Water Resources. He is Member of Parliament for the Sisala East Constituency, the Honorable Amidu Isahaku Chinia. Good morning, Honorable. Good morning, Lantam. Welcome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. How are you doing today? Oh, great. I mean, once you wake up healthy and strong, I mean, you should be happy. And uh, I'm happy. Except that my senior brother Bernard, as mischievous has he has always been, is 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 doing the same thing this morning, and he's here with his classmates, former PNC colleague, and so today you have two people from the PNC stock, with one with both legs now in NDC, and the other one with one leg in. NBC one leg in PNC <laughs> against uh, one man with two legs yeah, in MPP. Responding, eh? responding to what? I should respond. <laughs> no, your brother is talking. You want to respond? No, no respond. No respond. Why are you mention oh, yeah, uh, what is it? Uh, I never mentioned your name. No, no, no. I'm saying that. I never mentioned your name. When you just said outside here that the, the, what is it? Uh, how did you describe? Okay, no, you don't worry. Don't worry. All right, well, you are welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, also in the studio <laughs> is the uh, NDC parliamentary candidate for NDC parliamentary candidate for the Wale Wale constituency. Of course, uh, he served as Northern Regional Minister as well in the in the previous administration. Uh, Honorable Abu Bakari Abdullah. Good morning. Good morning, my brother. Welcome. Thank you so much. How are you doing today? I'm doing fine, but uh, saddened by the events of the nation. Every sane Ghanaian seems not to be doing well because of the kind of governance we're experiencing. And I, I hope that uh, Ghanaians listening to us this morning will really actually listen beyond the political party rhetorics and really think properly about what is good for this country. Mm. Uh, it's also an opportunity to meet once again my former general uh, secretary and my former chairman, a, f a classmate, a former party member, and I hope the deputy minister of sanitation will actually sanitize this environment by not uh, uh, dragging in uh, uh, irrelevant tangential matters. Just like Godfrey Dami, uh, okay. who is minister for injustice. Okay. He is also minister for That's sanitation. Fine. So I just want you to know that a resilient elephant should not be worried about an, a coconut and an, a, an umbrella, unless it is a wicked one. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> well, thank you for joining us. Let's, uh, let's straight away, you know, get into the, the issue, shall we? Um, and, of course, the issues about the Attorney General and Richard Jackma uh, rage on. And your, your party, Honorable, let me begin with you on this one. Your party, you know, has been very vocal about this matter. You want to probe into it. You want the Attorney General to step down. The AG's office insists that nothing wrong uh, has, been, has been done. Um, and, you know, wh whatever is happening outside has really got or is not very material to the current case that is in court. Why, why, why should the AG step down? Do you... Why are you supporting the call? Why are you calling for the AG to step down or to resign? Why does he have to? Thank you so much. Um, in fact, the current conversation about what has happened, this particular scandal that is being discussed with respect to the misconduct, professional misconduct by the Attorney General, has brought to the front banner the conversation about the need for us to decouple the Minister of Justice from the Attorney General. 
And why we think he should resign is not because we have some personal issues against him, but because we believe that his conduct has brought to the fore some significant matters relative to the pursuance of justice. A person who is supposed to be the chief prosecutor in this country, and everybody is aware that credibility is very important in the pursuance of justice. And therefore, if you have the attorney, attorney, attorney general himself violating the ethics of his profession as a lawyer, violating the ethics of his profession as an attorney general, clearly stipulated and indicated in their code of ethics that a lawyer should not speak to a represented person directly on matters related to an impending case. The audio that we showed mm. to Ghanaians is very clear and obviously listening to it with some objective mind, every Ghanaian will begin to see that you should be worried about the processes of securing justice in this country. If an attorney general can begin to coerce or in one way or the other try to influence a person to be able to give false evidence in court in order to secure the prosecution of somebody. You should be worried, but as a Ghanaian, not just a member of the NEC, everyone should be worried that our justice system cannot be run in this particular manner, particularly being the leader of the bar in terms of procuring justice in this country. For lack of time, let me just indicate that, and I hope Muslims who are listening will, 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 will understand this much better. When the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ passed on, and they wanted to collate his hadiths, his sayings and statements, one of the people who led the process got information that there was a particular gentleman elsewhere who was well informed about the activities of the Prophet and that he could amply provide truthful information. When the gentleman went around Gadre until he got to that gentleman, his encounter with him, the initial encounter, made him to refuse everything that he told him. He got there and realized that the man was deceiving a donkey with cereals in order to catch it. And the same man just walked out and said, but why have you traveled all this while to come and meet this man? And then refused to pick the information you need from him. He said, oh, no. Once he has the heart to be able to deceive a donkey, then such a person cannot be truthful. Attorney General, there's one single statement in that tip that should get every Ghanaian worried. I'm traveling. I will not be around, but I want to be present when you are giving your, being cross-examined and all that. And therefore, go and get a medical report indicating you are not well so that the case can delay for me to return. Credibility is cardinal in the administration of justice. And if an attorney general can not only, not only be dishonest, but encourages a witness to be dishonest, encourages a witness to be able to go and falsify documentations in order to influence the processes and activities of a case, ongoing case. This works straight into the critical element of credibility and that anybody who wants to pursue justice must be seen to be an individual of credibility. And this tape that we have shown, unfortunately, the MPP and the other people who have jumped into defense of the Attorney General are not actually dismantling the evidence, but they are rather talking about the fact that he didn't do anything wrong. And a lot of lawyers have spoken. Lawyers who are not even NDC. Lawyers at the highest levels have made out to understand that the statements made in the tape have actually confirmed that the Attorney General walked out of sanity and misbehaved and behaved unprofessionally. For this reason, we are calling for his resignation because we think that an individual that can be this dishonest and be able to falsify or encourage falsification of evidence indeed cannot preside over the process of securing justice for anybody in this country. 
They are quick to talk about the fact that the NDC is afraid because uh, our minority leader is going to be jailed and all that. It also pointed to a significant thing that Ghanaians listening this morning must begin to look at. Every time the conversation about corruption comes up for discussion, MPP communicators, perhaps my brother, the Honorable, will also go veer into that tangent. tangent. They are quick to point to the number of people they have successfully prosecuted, using that as an indicator of their commitment to fight corruption. And therefore, because they want to establish this indicator and be able to justify their performance with respect to fighting of corruption, they will do everything possible, even if they have to go to the unprofessional lens, to get people behind jail in order to justify the idea that for us as a party, we have prosecuted corrupt people, and therefore we are better fighters of corruption than the NDC. Because of that motivation, uh, the Attorney General seems to be interested in getting the minority leader into jail. We are not bothered about justice. We are bothered about the processes to secure justice. If the processes to securing justice is unjust, then the whole system becomes unjust. So, Attorney General, you may want to prosecute justice for Ghanaians. You may want to ensure that everybody who has done anything wrong in this country is prosecuted and faces justice, but that must not be secured through crooked means. Mm. And for us, we believe that Atto Fossen will not get fair trial. Justice will not be done to the case if the Attorney General is allowed to continue to stay in office, because if he stays in there, he will continue to influence and manufacture evidence that will enable him to secure conviction of the minority leader. And it is not just because of the minority leader. It is also because every Ghanaian who stands before a judge must have the opportunity to exonerate himself fairly, and if at the end of the day a person is being convicted for a crime, the processes leading to the conviction must be professional, ethical, and must be based on evidence. Right. But to secure concocted evidence to the extent of even asking for medical report. Look, that particular single crime alone has cascading crimes. If Japa had listened to him, Japa will go start seeking for falsified medical reports. That is a crime. The doctor who would have agreed to do it for him would have gotten himself involved in committing a crime. Then he would have presented it in court to deceive the court to delay the processes for just because of the whims and caprices of an attorney general who should have known better. This particular process in my view if triggered at all should never be triggered by an attorney general. And this attorney general that we care until half. If Ghanaians are serious about the administration of justice in this country, that is not the kind of person we should be having as our attorney general. Hmm. Okay. Um, Bernard Mora, let me, let, me, let me come to you now, of course. Uh, you've also been speaking um, on, this, on this matter on some, some other platforms. Are you, are you also backing the calls for the attorney general to, <coughs> to step down? Well, first, good morning to all of you in particular to my former classmate and also a former member of the PNC who worked very hard and tirelessly for the gains that the PNC had always made in the Mampusi East constituency. There is no doubt that he contributed to maintaining our votes ever since his departure we've not been able to garner the kind of numbers that we used to garner but I assure him that in the 2024 elections he will have the PNC to contend with and not the MPP that has been broken into pieces by the outcome of the uh, parliamentary primaries to my kid brother Chinia I hope that he takes advice from Abdallah, that he should sanitize our discussions today and not become minister for a filth. 
just as Godfrey Dami has become Minister for Injustice. We of Arise Ghana could not have described Godfrey Dami and his attitude in any better terms than describing him as Minister for Injustice. And we came to this conclusion after, and I think that it should not just be a call for Godfrey Dami to go, actually. We made an error by not including the Deputy Attorney General Chua, who also on the 24th of May spoke out of the reach of his mouth that, that after the Attorney General was accused in court, open court, that he was coercing, calling, and wanting fabrications and the responses that Japa would give should be said that it should implicate the minister, uh, the former deputy minister of finance. Godfrey Dami was virtually confused, flummoxed, that he did not, could not say anything. Then he took the deputy attorney general to now get to his office and issue a statement and indicated in that statement that there was no meeting whatsoever, no conversation whatsoever, no calls whatsoever were made to Richard Jaffa. You have a copy of that statement. The next day, the PA to the minister now says that there was a meeting at a certain justice's house. Mm -hmm. And that they knew that the Jaffa was recording the conversation there. And that there's nothing wrong. And that Jaffa came and met them at the justice's home. Mm -hmm. Now, it turned out that there was no conversation that was recorded in the justice's home. But that the attorney general willy-nilly picked his phone and called Jaffa. And in the conversation is that the attorney general is prosecuting a matter that he is completely ignorant. The attorney general does not understand what constitutes the main contract. So much that in the audio, it has to take Jaffa now to be explaining to him. And the attorney general at one point said, oh, so the 50, of course, I, I keep saying that English is not for us. So we are learning it. Because you can't have tranches of 50. You can have tranches of four, of which each tranche is 50. 50. Mm -hmm. But in the conversation, Japa kept referencing that the tranches of 50. So 200. And the minister said no. So the 200 vehicles, ambulances, are different from the 50. So the contract is different. Then Jaffa said, no. Go and read the contract. It is 200. Chop into 50. First lot, 50. Second, 50. Third, 50. Fourth, 50. But each of the 50 will be done when an LC is issued. And an LC is not payment. It's virtually like a guarantee. Mm -hmm. The Minister for Justice is not properly clothed is not educated on what an LC is. This is captured in the conversation. Now, I'm saying that we should have added the deputy minister because the deputy, deputy minister lied that there was no meeting, there was no con conversation, there was no phone calls, and there couldn't have been any recording. So the deputy minister did not know that behind him the boss was acting in such manner. You lied. And yesterday, he had the effrontery to come and tell us that the minister will not resign. Yes. Says Who minister. is a deputy minister to say that your will boss will not resign? Down. Where is that coming from? Well, he's in contact with his no. boss. It's, 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 that's the, that's his the boss is an appointee. Information that he's relayed he is, to The us. boss is an appointee, just as he's an appointee. All the calls for his boss to be dismissed are not targeted at the deputy minister to act. Mm -hmm. Nobody is asking the deputy minister to dismiss the boss. Why are people belching like that? Where is this arrogance coming from? Pomposity of no significance. 
Who are you a deputy minister to say that your boss will not be dismissed or will not resign? What is your locus? Oh, he's deputy attorney general. A deputy attorney general is an appointee of the president. And the, the president will appoint you in consultation with your minister. Yeah. So you cannot say your boss will not resign or cannot be sacked. Well, there are calls for him to resign and he's probably so, in, so contact, therefore, in contact with his boss. His boss has told him, I'm not resigning. So he will be sacked. Because that is the next call. That if he's not resigning, he should be sacked. And the person who sack him is the president, not you. Yeah. So this arrogance of our appointees, I don't know where it's coming from. Then the second one. We are talking about a public institution, a state institution. When we say you are a minister, you are not a, pa a party executive. You are a minister for everybody, irrespective of whether they belong to your party or not. Mm -hmm. So when we say minister for justice, whether I am of your party or not of your party, I am supposed to get justice. So people of Ghana are talking about our minister for justice. And then the MPP decide through their legal committee chairman to go and respond. <laughs> what, what do we have to do with MPP legal committee chair? What do we have to do with them? The call for the man to be dismissed or to resign has nothing to do with the MPP legal committee. In fact, what the MPP legal committee is supposed to be doing is to check and realize that things within the MPP are done in accordance with the laws of their party constitution. Oh, but there's someone that they see as a member of their party, who is, is also the attorney what general. What position does he hold he as a member of the party? He occupies the high office of the attorney general. There are many people that so have occupied the obviously. office of attorney general before Godfrey Dami. Yes. They never took this party down cloth to wear. And so in doing this, the MPP ought not to have responded. You see, sometimes uh, you miss some people that you don't know. Dan Bochi was MPP general secretary. When the electoral commission wanted to introduce... No, when the minister and the government wanted to introduce a procurement committee for the Electoral Commission, involving government appointees, two members of the Electoral Commission, two, one member of the political parties, mm -hmm. and then the Minister for Finance and other people to constitute a, a procurement board for yeah. the Electoral Commission. When the other political party decided to rally in opposition to this procurement decision, Dambochi got up and said, why? Government is different from the party. And that as a political party, they also are opposed to the infiltration of the Electoral Commission's work by a procurement committee. Dan mm. He was able to distinguish the party from the government. All of a sudden, our standards have gone too low. That people don't know that actors of government are different from the political party. So everything that somebody goes to do as an appointee, the party must come to defend. What it means is that the party has deliberately appointed these people either to be thieves or to do injustice to the people of Ghana. The MPP should not want to be associated with such characters. So you don't think the MPP should be defending the Attorney General? Why? The Attorney General's office has a PRO, or they don't have. And the PRO is paid. We also have a minister responsible for information that communicates the decisions of government. So if the PRO of the Attorney General is paid and there are issues surrounding the Attorney General's office and the PRO cannot come and attend, attend to them, then it means that that office should be scrapped. We are wasting money there. The Ministry of Information is the one that takes government information out and the stance on, of government. Not the MPP. We don't take information from the MPP. So, you see, it's like this has always been a planting. And this is how they want to go about it. Now, to the substance. You know... So it have to be... I, I will do yes, it. Yes, London on your submission so that I can bring on... A I do this. That aside the ignorance that the Attorney General displayed, this same Attorney General... And also aside, the issue that he asked somebody to go and falsify his health, obtain a medical certificate, excuse duty, 
bring it to the court, and the person tells you that you want this judge to issue an Iran for me. And the minister said, oh, this one, the judge will not issue an Iran, uh, a warrant. What is the relationship that somebody who is prosecuting has with a judge to be able to tell when the judge can issue a warrant and cannot issue a warrant? So in this instance, the judge and her reputation is also being questioned. That the attorney general virtually says that why? What I say is what you do. So justice is what the attorney general says it is. And not what the court will say. And I feel that, look, this is very dangerous. So where we stand as Arise Ghana, we back the call that Kweku and Sasari, former director of Ghana Law School, yeah. and also the president of Mount Crest University, says that, look, citizens and the bar in particular are disappointed about the defacing of justice in this country. And that the longer the Attorney General stays in office, the image of law has gone down. Godfrey Dami went through Kweku uh, uh, and Sasari. And this is what the man is saying. And the man is no mean person. And saying that if the man is not resigning, President Akufado sack him. If the president is not sacking him, that the president should be impeached. Because this issue borders about the fundamental. Look, we've bastardized the legislature. We've bastardized the executive. The only organ of government that we are still trying to protect is the judiciary. And this is how far the leader of the bar can bring the image of the judiciary. So, look, Arise Ghana insists that okay. Godfrey Damis continues to stay in office. It's an affront to justice delivery. And, in fact, there is no justice. Okay. Honorable Chinia, let me bring you in now. You know, um, of course, you've heard what your uh, co-panelists have got to say about this. Backing calls for the Attorney General to step down. Do you, do you agree? I've heard your national organizer say that the Attorney General is not going to resign today, tomorrow, or the day after. Do you agree? Well, let me say good morning to you and uh, to my senior brother, Bernard, and uh, the former minister. He's also your senior brother. Yeah. Uh, but the former minister has wit. I mean, former regional minister is a big man. Thank you. But you are yeah. a former deputy regional minister. The uh, deputy is still, I'm still under him. So you couldn't have authorized that your boss will not be dismissed. <laughs> I can express my opinion. <laughs> and the deputy is expressing his opinion. Could you have said that Dr. Hafiz bin Sali? I could, have, I could have expressed my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> Just like my colleague is doing. Yeah, well, and then let me say good morning to the people of Sisala uh, we, are, we are live on Sisala Radio, and uh, my constituents are listening to us this morning. Good morning to it's all of Sisala them. Radio. It's your radio. How do you people get confused about oh, no, but please just carry on with your submission and good morning to those listening on Cisala. everybody good morning to you all everybody including you <laughs> including the NDC members, members everywhere I mean they are friends I mean why yes now to I mean the, the, the issue of or the demand by the minority or the NDC for the Attorney General to resign is their right and it's within the context of our law that when there are matters like this individuals or groups have the right to express their views as to what should happen but you see long term we need to situate the issues properly when this NDC started talking, when the man made a statement in court, confronted the AG, that he had tried to influence him to forcefully testify against the first accused, that is a minority leader, so that he could be convicted. Subsequent to that, you heard all the commentary in Ghana by the NDC, that they have a tape and in that tape, the Attorney General is heard coaching the third accused person to falsely testify against 
the first accused. That was all what they were saying. Mm -hmm. Is that not the case? Yes. When they eventually played the tape, tell me which part of the tape where you heard the attorney general coercing the, with the third accused to give false information in court to convict the first accused. There is no portion of the tape where you heard the attorney general coercing the, the, the third accused. But, but if you listen to the conversations, I mean, there's a conversation where the attorney general uh, is saying something along those lines. And Richard Japa is saying that... Did you, you hear the attorney can, general? Did you, you, hear, you, you hear him? He will be dishonest. Did you hear, did, and it will be like he, knowing that somebody is innocent Lantam. and he's Lantam. You know, testifying against the this person. Is, this is a concocted tape, right? Co concocted how? But you, heard, you, you clearly heard... The Richard Jaffa saying that I can't do that, I can't do that. Yes. But you never heard the Attorney General making any statement asking him to testify against the, 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 the first accused. Did you hear any statement? There was nothing. There was nothing. Let anybody tell me which part of the tape that they played that you heard the AG telling the third accused that say this and this and that in court so that I can convict. The first accused. No, so when you listen There's to the like questions that. that were played, I mean, hearing... it was prior. It was to a prior conversation, and Richard Jackman was reacting. Possibly, obviously, so, if you listen to the conversation, did you hear the conversation? Did you hear the suggestions AG? that the AG had had made? Lantam is simple. Yes. Did you hear any part in the conversation? The AG coercing the third accused that say this and say that and say that against the first accused. Mm. There's nothing like that. There's nothing in the tape that suggested that the, the, the AG was coercing the third accused person to submit or to make any claim or any testimonies against the first accused. So, and that was the crux of the NDC's claim. They made so much noise that in the tape you hear uh, the AG coercing and, 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 and coaching the, the third accused to testify against a two person. Now, finally, when they play the tape, there is no portion of the tape where you hear the AG coercing or coaching the third accused to testify against the first accused. Except that you hear the third accused making claims, I can't do that, I can't be dishonest. It is his own take. And then they've gone to find... But that was premised on something, they've gone right? To, on what? On a prior conversation. A prior what, what, conversation. Did, what did the girlfriend Dami say? <coughs> I am asking you, did you hear? Did you hear Godfrey Dami coaching him to testify mm -hmm. against... I heard the Attorney General say, you ask for him, he doesn't have a problem um, at all if he's able to... Problem about what? Well, we don't know exactly what so it is that he was talking about. So they have brought together. Well, but yeah. there, are, there are security analysts who are saying that it's so, so not, they have it's brought pieces together because they, if you bring the voice of the attorney general saying that he doesn't have a problem, what has occasion he say he doesn't have a problem? Mm. It's not there. So you believe it's a doctor tape? It's a doctor tape. <laughs> now let me let me get to the substance of the case and let you and I appreciate why the attorney general doesn't need to coach or coerce the third witness in this matter. And I am surprised, Bernard, because of politics, you are suggesting that the Attorney General doesn't understand even the case. And doesn't, I mean, if people have doctored a tape and they have put pieces together to, to, to cause apprehension in the state, you should know. Now, the basis for which the Attorney General is in court are very clear. One, what the Attorney General, for me, what the Attorney General needs to convict at two force or otherwise is the contract that was signed, the, 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 the contract that was passed by Parliament regarding the procurement of the 200 ambulances to the contract between the government of Ghana represented by the Minister of Health and then a big C and then the testimony of the former finance minister. Now, after the Attorney General put his case before the court, the NDC, uh, the two forces led by his lawyer and the other accused persons, made a submission of no case. Mm -hmm. Meaning that 
the matter put before the court that did not merit even going to the, the substance of the case. And when they did that, what did the court do? The court said there was a case to answer. Mm -hmm. So let's, you should come and open your defense. So by then, the Attorney General has submitted and made available every information he needed to put before the court on which basis he is trying to force him and the other two persons. Now, one important contention in the case has been whether Atu Forsen issuing the uh, LCs, the letters of credit, letters of credit, yes, was with the authority of the finance minister, which mm -hmm. is both because he on his own doesn't have the authority. Yes, that is a major concern of the court. But I think, I mean, the finance minister, you know, has said that he authorized that. The, the finance minister then said, uh, is on record to have said term. he land term authorized that. Cool down. In court. In court. Yes. So you were talking so, about so you were talking about Sethepe's cross examination. I, I, I was saying that the key things the Attorney General needed in the case was the fact that he put his case before the court. The minority leader, lawyer, filed or submitted submission of no case. No, submission of no case. Yes. The court and that was rejected, no. and so they there went to trial. To answer. Yes. And so they have to open their defense. So whatever the Attorney General needed to put before the court was before the court. And one of the key things, like I was mentioning, is the testimony of the former Minister for Finance. And he said he had authorized the Deputy Minister to establish the LCs. And the evidence is the fact that the seal of the Finance Minister... Mm -hmm. was put on the LCs. But, Lantam, the Attorney, the Attorney General cross-examined the Finance Minister, tried to find, because there are documentations that emanated from the Finance Ministry, and none of them were signed by the Finance Minister or referred to the uh, Deputy Minister. If there is anything in my ministry today, it comes to the Minister for Sanitation and Water Resources. He will have to refer and, and, and specifically say that Deputy Minister, do one, two, three. Without that authority from the minister, if I act, I'm acting contrary to law. Because I'm not a substantive. I'm, by the constitution of Ghana, the deputy is to assist the minister. To the extent that even when the minister is not there, the deputy cannot act. They have to allow a, a different minister to come and act. Because the constitution is very categorical that the president appoints the deputy in consultation with the minister for you, the deputy minister, to come and assist. So you don't have your own powers. And for me, the cross-examination by the AG on, uh, what is it, the former finance minister. Mm. I mean, I am not the court, so I don't determine. But... The, the, all the questions the AG put before the former finance minister, he couldn't indicate any documentation that shows that he authorized the guy, uh, the, the, his deputy, to do that. Yeah, but he gave the, his word in court. Word and uh, oath. I mean, so 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 can you can you uh, can if if there is a management decision in this uh, station, and the the, the the head of the station, what is giving you power to do something mm -hmm. official? Mm -hmm. Does he write or he just tells you with his mouth? Because if you say it with your mouth and there is a problem, it's your word against his word. There is no proof. So the cross-examination actually showed that there is nothing to show that the former finance minister gave authority to the deputy minister to do what he did. And I can, I can suggest or I can say that the seals of the finance minister which found their way onto the, the LCs the, the deputy minister submitted were stolen once. Oh, we don't know that. And let, let's the, and the there, case is there, and the case is still ongoing. Yes, there, but there is court. nothing. So, so let's be let's be. A bit, there is nothing. Let's the be a bit himself, measured in the, how we. The, the, the AG asked him. Run commentary about you know, the an minister, ongoing case. The minister right? even appeared before Yoko, before the court case, and Yoko, when they confronted him, whether he had any document to show that he gave authority, there was nothing. There was nothing. Mm. All right. Now, so, now, now. So, 
Yes. Apart from that. Yes. And you have to be rounded up. You have apart, to, apart you have to be that. landing in the next 30 seconds for me. The third accuse has on behalf of the suppliers, that is Big C, put before the AG a plea bargain. A plea bargain. Now it is admission. And when you put a, a plea bargain, it's admission of guilt. Now what? Not necessarily. It Not is. Necessarily. It is. Not necessarily. It, it depends is. on the circumstance. It is. It is. Why they have not... So, so what it tells you is that the third accused from the onset has made effort to find a way of exonerating the first accused. The third accused from the beginning by... by, by Going to the AG Offering with to a pay plea, money. plea bargaining means that he supports, he is finding a way of getting the first accused out of the case. And in fact, the first accused lawyer had written to the AG to say they had no problem with the plea bargain by the, the third accused. They had no problem. It means if, if the AG agrees for a plea bargaining, they don't have a problem. Yeah, they the don't AG. want a full tryout. All right. So and so it is clear that the first, second, and third accused are on the same trajectory. Okay. So why right. would the AG, knowing that this is somebody who brought a plea bargain, which I rejected, in support of the first accused, go and engage him uh, on these matters? Now, my colleague, okay, well. my, my, uh, my, my, uh, brother, uh, my brother uh, made I, a I point. Oh, come I haven't back. finished. My brother no, made no, a point. No, no, but he needs to make a point. Some time. He you, made you, a point you, about you, the fact that... You've spoken beyond the, the, AG, beyond the time. The AG, you've spoken beyond the time. The AG so had contacted me, the third accused with his lawyers. In the court, the third accused had announced to the court that the lawyer that he had, he has disengaged him. And it was... During that period, they met... And okay. according to all right, I mean, very well. Honorable, let, let, let me bring you back in as so, we so round it up on this, on, on this matter. True. All right, very well. Um, I, I so, in the next just two, two minutes to round I think up on this matter, just two listen minutes. To us must understand what the MPP and their communicators are trying to do. When we came to school, Chief Bernard Mona, I would remember there was a story about a gentleman who prepared very well to write an essay on a rabbit. But when he got to the exam, there was, he, wrote, he prepared to write on a bandicoot. But when he got there, there was a rabbit. He just didn't know what to say. So what he said was that a rabbit and a bandicoot are both living in the forest. At this particular point, one may wonder what is a bandicoot. So he had an opportunity to pour all the apple about the bandicoot, even though the question was about a rabbit. <laughs> we are here this morning to discuss the conduct of the Attorney General. We are not here to discuss the substantive issue before the court and whether the AG can secure conviction based on other things. My brother says that if you listen to the tape, you won't find anything in it that shows that he was coercion. My brother, go and look at relationship in terms of power imbalance. When people of power imbalance engage, of an equal power engage in a conversation, the person with power has so many ways of coercing an individual without using words like coercion. If you tell me that when you come in there, you say A, B, C, D, and if you do it the way I want it, there will be no consequences on you. He said that clearly in the tape. What does that mean? He's offering him, because he has a power to decide what happened. Because as attorney general, there's a lot of power he has. And if you listen to the tape, at a point, the gentleman asked him, so if I get you right, is this what you are trying to let me do? He said, yo, let's take it like that. I'm quoting him, let's take it like that. And he said, no, I can't do it the way you want it. So when a power, a person of proportional greater power is dealing with you and asking you to do something his way against your will, there's nothing cohesive than that. That's the point Ghanaians must know. Right. Secondly, the right. issue about the disagreement. And what, long for me, that's I think so that we move uh, on. why important thing we have to talk about is that the MPP is quick to drag in this conversation of the plea bargaining. Does the process of plea bargaining preclude or include unprofessional conduct? Does the conditions of plea bargaining allow an attorney general to engage in unprofessional conduct by asking a witness to come and say something or present falsified documents to get things done in a particular way? No, 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 no. Right. Last thing, last thing. Right. Look, you are talking about the fact that the attorney general doesn't need to coerce the gentleman to produce evidence for him to be able to secure conviction. 
He needs. He needs all the documents you have talked about, including witnesses' statement in court. And the witnesses, the witness of Jakpa has significance in determining the outcome of this result. And therefore, if he's being forced to falsify, and Jakpa is aware that if he goes this particular direction, this man is asking me to go, it will influence the outcome of the judgment. Why do you say that his witness doesn't have, I see it doesn't have an effect? Mm. It has. Okay. Look, please. This particular case, the MPP, you have done so many things in this country, and I think you are now getting immune to the wrong things. And therefore, every day, you keep getting deeper, deeper into things that a party that is leading a country of this nature should not be involved in. My brother, honorable, you may want to defend your party, but let us also have boundaries to know that at the end of the day, whatever we defend also has repercussions on our reputation. Okay. And I think that uh, the MPP must slow down the way they do it. All right, very well. Uh, Bernard, let me, let me come to you for your final submission on this. Well, I just think that um, the MPP has no locus in responding to issues that border on public institutions, that a deputy minister has no power whatsoever to determine the propriety of his minister or otherwise. Thirdly, that Godfrey Dami has defaced and debased the face of justice delivery in this country. That as he continues to stay in office as Minister for Justice, there will not be many a Ghanaian that will be going to court with the Attorney General and hoping that he will be able to secure justice. In that direction, the decisions of court will begin to be disrespected because we know that we have a scandalous attorney general who will do everything to procure judgment in the favor of government so that he can continue to stay in office. When things come to that, the judiciary is at risk of losing the respect and honor that society has for it. Mm. All right. Well, well Honorable Chinia, your final Yes, uh, the first thing I want to say, my, my brother is still making reference to the tape and suggesting that uh, the Attorney General was coercing the uh, third accused to say to testify against the first accused. You are pointing to things you can hear clearly from the third accused, who say he says he can't do that. You want me to uh, agree to your terms and all that. But what the Attorney General is purported to have said, leading to that, cannot be heard on the tape. I don't understand. There is nothing. There is nothing. The Attorney General said, "Say one, two, three against uh, what is it? The, the, the first accused so that I can convict him." There's nothing like that on the tape. And you you saw it when they were playing the tape. The, the National Chairman of the NDC was now giving further information from the top of his head, not from the tape. That was what he was doing. It's complete diversion of Ghanaians' attention from the substantive issue. All what NDC is seeking to do, because they have at the parliament level, at several levels, they've tried to intervene, tried to get people to intervene for, for, for the, the case to be discontinued, and because they are not succeeding, and they are seeing that probably there is a solid case, <laughs> uh, what is it, the Attorney General is, is prosecuting. They have to falsify and, and get a doctor tape to come and try to. Uh, tarnish the image of the Attorney General so that they can divert Ghanaians' attention from the real issues. Okay. I mean, the, the, the LC, uh, let me tell you, the LC that were established, there was a parliamentary approval, and the parliamentary approval indicated that uh, Stambic Bank was responsible uh, to, to, to do the, uh, what is it, deliver the uh, LCs. The, the, the LCs got expired, and then now the Deputy Finance Minister established different LCs with a different bank, contrary to the parliamentary approval. The evidence against him is, 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 is adequate. All right, very well. I mean, they're only trying to divert Ghanaians' F attention thank from you very the But then right. he said that they have a tape. Yes, they've said they have a tape. So and then they've, been the tape? To, they've been asked to, if they say this one is doctored, they've been asked to produce the original no, tape. No, no, like they that. should produce the original yeah, tape. Like Number like two, that. So they, they claim that... Original tape like that. All right, very well. But we need to move on. So that we don't like spend all our time on this matter. Yes. The NDC, what the Atu Forsen's lawyer has gone to court to ask the court to stop the case and start a retrial. 
Now the issues they put before the court, did they include this tape? There is a Supreme Court ruling. They couldn't add this tape because it is uh -huh. fake. That if you say that a tape is doctored, produce the original. And I'm when telling they said you, they had tapes and evidence, and they came to do their court press conference. It was like a football. No, but we didn't said. say we have a tape. We didn't. You said you had evidence, and that you had even even the attorney general. Anyway, the attorney general. Anyway, the attorney general, anyway, anyway, attorney general I think uh, moving forward. He has a video. Moving CCC forward, camera. Move, moving forward, but, moving, but, for, but, moving but, forward, we will, but, we will see what but, decisions but, will be taken but, regarding the Attorney General and his stay in office, you know, on this on this particular that, matter. But the let's move on. Let's move on. Let's talk about the Pualugu Dam and the 12 million US dollars that was paid to a contractor responsible for the Pualugu Multipurpose Irrigation Dam project. So the, the, the Ghana Irrigation Development Authority is saying that uh, the $12 million that was paid uh, was part of the contractual agreement with Nessus Power Construction Corporation. Uh, the payments totaling $11.9 million was designated as mobilization funds. Gentlemen, please, we're on a different subject. And so uh, GIDA has emphasized that the payments to Power China was made in accordance with the terms of the contract which stipulated, which stipulated a mobilization fee. So this is the explanation that has been um, that has been given now. And uh, Honorable Chini, on this one, I'll, I'll begin with you, of course. There's been a lot of calls for there to be a proper probe into this. And, you know, there, is, there hasn't been an understanding as to how 12 million should be paid to a contractor. And there's absolutely no work and nothing on the Pualugu Dam side. Now, the GIDA, which is the Ghana Irrigation Development Authority, is saying that this was just a mobilization fee. But it's an argument that the uh, minority and those who are raising alarm about this are not buying. Do, do, do you buy what Gida is saying about this well, money being just well, mobilization fee? Long time when this matter came up on uh, Monday, was it Monday, Tuesday, I was on Metro TV and personally I, I had the cause to request that the relevant ministries or agencies and for that matter government need to come and, and, and speak on this matter. Mm. Because if you look at the video of uh, the ranking member for energy, your Honorable John Jinapo, when he visited the site with uh, Honorable Bawa, and the report that came up, it, it gave cause to be worried. Because if government has expended $11.9 million and there is nothing to show and nobody is speaking to us, and we don't understand how that money was expended. I mean, you, you should be worried. And I am happy that following that uh, the irrigation authority has issued a statement. But before I speak to the statement, I also even request that, I mean, either parliament energy committee as a whole or a committee of agric can still visit the site and engage some relevant institutions to interrogate the issues further so that we can clearly understand. But I think the, the statement issued by the Ghana Education Authority at least gives some information that is a bit relieving because from the beginning it was just I mean you could you couldn't understand 11.9 million dollars yeah and and nothing nothing to show and on that Metro TV program I actually said that you know in contracting sometimes you can have preliminary payments mm -hmm. that you can pay money for works that may not necessarily show physically on the site because maybe the contractor, uh, you have a consultant who has, to, or the contractor himself has to do design, uh, designs of the project and so many things. That may not be physical on site. And, and I think that the statement actually uh, vindicates that position. That, uh, because if you look at uh, what the irrigation authority has issued, they have actually detailed the what the money was used for. I mm -hmm. mean, the project is in two components. Yeah, the component one is mm -hmm. uh, 60 megawatts uh, hydropower yes. and 50 megawatts 
uh, solar power. Yes. That is component Y. And that will cost 588 million 242,585.94 dollars. That is component one. And the component two is on irrigation mm -hmm. of uh, 125,000 hectare uh, infrastructure. And that will also cost 404,705,7414.06 million dollars. Uh, so when you put the two together, you are getting over 900 million dollars. Now, there was supposed to be uh, a mobilization payment, mm -hmm. and the 11.9 million represent 25 percent of the uh, mobilization payment. And according to the statement, the this money was paid in trenches. Mm -hmm. uh, they first paid two million five hundred eighty-five thousand, another five three, million three trenches. for uh -huh. In three trenches. Yes, so, in three trenches. So they did, they did that. And, and it pays mobilization fee for, you know, some works that... So they, they work... And there's some, also some physical... Yes, work yes, also some, some physical work. But so, that has not manifested. Well, they, they say that the following uh, activities were... They, they were supposed to be, one, detailed engineering designs... Yes. ...were supposed to be drawn... Yes. ...by the contractor. Yes. This one, physically, you can't find it on mm -hmm. site. But it has been done. They were supposed to do environmental and social impact assessment. Mm -hmm. It has been done. They were supposed to do topographic survey mm -hmm. and mapping. You can't find this on the ground, but it has been done according to the report. Geology and geotechnical studies and drawings. This is not something you expect to find physically on the ground. But according to the report, it has been done. Soil and land suitability assessment was supposed to be done. It's not something you can find physically on the ground. It has been done. And then design report and drawings in part one to three. Then you have settlement, uh, resettlement action plan. Mm -hmm. This is a plan. So I've heard some people saying that they were to resettle the people. But from, from this report, it's a resettlement plan. So they, they, they are to do a plan on how to resettle the people, but not the actual settlement. So you don't expect that they should have settled the people. Mm -hmm. And then they were supposed to do a cadastral survey. And then the actual construction that was supposed to be done yeah. as part of this, uh, uh, what is a mobilization payment, yes. was construction of access road, yes. of 5.2 kilometers access road, off the main Sariba Kwesimpe road. Yes. And then another uh, four kilometers around the camp where they, they, were, where they were constructing the camp. Mm -hmm. And the camp itself was also uh, part of part of it, part of yeah, it. but the camp is not there. But they, they constructed it. But they, they, there is there is there is there is the allegation that they have taken it. Yeah, off. there's nothing there. There's so nothing that is why I'm right. asking for further investigation. Right. But from the report, you can see pictures of the camp, and people have visited it. They've seen the camp. So if it is no longer there, we have to do further interrogation and okay. establish that. So you don't believe so, anything on tour has happened with I mean, regard to this payment. I I I am I am I am. Is but we still need to do further investigation. Right. But between today, uh, 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 if you ask me now, and as a Tuesday, I'll say that Tuesday I, I was I was very very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. But from what I have seen now, at least there's evidence they have categorized the the components of what the money has been used for. Right. We can still go further and interrogate uh, and, and and get more information and ask more questions for answers and all that. But at least now there is indication of how the money has been spent. Right. And, and also the, it has been clarified that, they, 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 you know, what confused all of us is the fact that they say final payment. Yes. They say it's, it's, it it's was an in error. Branches. Yes, it was an error. It was an error. Because even that mobilization, what they had paid out of the mobilization is just 25%. Yeah. So it means that the mobilization has not been fully paid. Now, long time, the, the, the other thing that... Uh, we also need to know this project was supposed to be funded as part of the Sino Hydro uh, program, and so the government of Ghana had an obligation to also advance about I think about 40 million dollars or so. So I'm sure these payments is coming from what Ga government of Ghana is supposed to support the project with, mm. and, and 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 they have expended 11.9 uh, million dollars. Uh, but as you know, Sino Hydro projects. Uh, our our issues with the, our bilateral partners yes. has stalled, and then 
they, they, they are, they've not released any money. And government of Ghana thought we could mobilize uh, uh, our own resources. Unfortunately, we would not be able to do that. But let me say, this is a historical challenge that we need to deal with. The importance of the Kualubu Dump cannot be underestimated. So it's, and, it's, and you it's, can it's see clearly, project. you can see clearly from Nkrumah to date, every government has had a plan to do it. If you look at the NDC 2012 manifesto, Kalugu Dump was there. So every government from Nkrumah to date has thought about it, and and unfortunately we had taken a step. The contract was awarded. The source of funding had a challenge, and we could not also fund it from GOG. Uh, but now our interest is about the $11.9 million because we want to be sure that it is not wasted funds. Okay. Uh, Honorable, let me come to you now. Is, there, is, is this satisfactory, the explanation given by GIDA about this $11.9 million and how it has been expended? Um, Lanta, I want to call on Ghanaians this morning listening to us to let us run away from mediocrity. Governance is a serious business. And offering explanations for failure is not part of effective governance. The MPP government at this stage are always quick to offer explanations for non-performance. And they get satisfied with their explanations. Oh. When you were talking, I was quiet. You said a lot of things I needed to react. So just sit down. If you don't respect me, the audience, respect me as your elder brother when we get back home. Serious business. Well, I think there's a lot of respect for each yes, other. Yes, yes, I know. I know. So I'm just drawing his attention. It's, to just, it's, it's fine. I have to no. remind him. I have a responsibility. And it's a, and, 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 I have a responsibility. And it's a discussion. I have a responsibility. So to sometimes remind him. we allow room for. It's just, it's just, it's just the sometimes. public part of the presentation. But, yes. but just to draw his attention. Carry on. When we go beyond Kintampo, I can summon him <laughs> to respond questions to me as an elder brother. So he should be calm. The fact, the fact of the matter is that. This conversation we're having this morning, mm -hmm. in other jurisdictions, a lot of things would have happened where they appreciate governance and what governance is about. You sign a contract with Ghanaians through the social contract. It's a social contract to deliver development for the people of Ghana. And for me to go into this discussion, I want to bring three important contexts, very important matters that will clarify the context for this conversation. One, when His Excellency, the Vice President, was campaigning in 2016, one of the issues that he trumpeted and the question he kept asking was, His Excellency John Dramani Mahama, as a northerner, tell the people what you have done for the people of the north in these four years of your presidency. It was a question he asked almost everywhere he went in the north. I want people, listeners, to take note of that question. I want listeners to take note of some other series of similar projects that have stalled and yet Ghanaian money has been put down the drain. Everybody will remember the Mother Angel contract. These people go and conceptualize a project. They go and do procurement, get a consultant to do whatever they want to do. At the end of the day, the project is bought, aborted, monies go down the drain, unaccounted for. Mm. Is this part of effective governance? That but but Gina has given a breakdown. I'm when coming. you look at the I'm, statement I'm that coming. they issued, they've, they've given a breakdown. They've offered an explanation for non performance. An explanation of for what the money has gone into, for the various things that they were supposed the to do. The ultimate goal is to get the work done, but not to explain to us why the work has not been done. And to justify why you spent our money in an uncompleted project. So, so we're not is, satisfied with the explanation that, that Gita not has, that we are not satisfied. has given. I'm not interested in the explanation. I'm interested in the series of projects where this government have contracted other organizations or companies to deliver services and projects. At the end of the day, the project is not done. We stop talking about the project, but yet some amount of money has been spent. And yet that money is gone. That's what I'm talking about. Mm. And I'm saying that in jurisdictions where governance is a serious business, unlike mm -hmm. Ghana, mm -hmm. those are serious matters. One, we talked about the Ejapa deal. Mm -hmm. $12 million went through consultancy and other distance. Where is the project? Nothing has been done. The PDS, how much money did we lose? 
If you go in there, even as we speak now, it is on record through the other generous report that PDS is holding about 2 million Ghanaians in that they have not accounted to Ghanaians. It's gone. If you go to the Motor Angel project I'm talking about, mm -hmm. the expansion of the Tema Motorway, mm -hmm. a lot of money was put into it. There's nothing going on in that particular place. All these activities, series of activities, there are always explanations as to how, how that money has been spent. But in the end, what they promised the people of Ghana to do is not done. We forget about it and go and get a new project again, conceptualize it, spend money halfway, leave it, it is not done. That is a very good example of an incompetent government. Let's come to Palo. The third issue I want to talk about is the development dichotomy between the North and the South. And I get worried that the players in our governance seem not to understand what they are doing. My big brother, the vice president, just only last week or two, was around Medina there about commissioning infrastructure for the comfort of Kaya'i. We are dealing with symptoms. The Kaya menace is as a result of the fact that farmlands are no longer fertile up enough, farming is no longer a lucrative thing, young men who should have been tilling the land to make a living are no longer able to do that. Farming is no longer lucrative. People are not farming. And therefore, the young men are running down south. And my big brother goes to Medina to make life comfortable for Kaya so that more and more of them will travel all the way from the north because there's an opportunity here. And if you go and look at the age of the people who are involved in that, I'm providing context. The people who are involved in this, mm -hmm. you realize that there are people of school going age who are out of school. Mm -hmm. There are young girls as old, young as seven years old, eight years old, 12 years old, who are roaming the streets of Accra because of Kai. And yet somebody's idea is not to find a way of stopping the rural urban migration that is leading to the Kai. And yet the person is thinking about making them comfortable here. Look, let me tell you this. The dam, the Palgo dam, as said by the president, Nanado, is actually indeed something that would be a game changer in terms of the development. And as a northerner and also a person from the Walewale constituency, which is going to harbor about 80% of the dam's project, yes. I am weeping internally to hear the story. And the Gidesh letter, my brother, let me draw your attention to something. Mm -hmm. And you should be wrapping up with your subject. The Gidesh letter. That I can come to. The Gidesh letter. Bernard. If you look at it as a student of governance and a practitioner of development, there are three questions I'm asking. Mm -hmm. Accountability is key to governance. And when you are asking for accountability, you should be talking about commitments, mm -hmm. obligations, okay? And the commitment and the obligations this government made was not to go and construct Palugu multi-purpose camp. The commitment to us is to construct Palugu multi-purpose dam, not camp. Today, if you listen to all the MPP communicators, they are always going to tell, oh, the people are saying there's nothing there. There is a camp and there's a 5.4 kilometer road. They go ahead and justify the quantum of money that has been spent by counting invisible things that people cannot verify. Hmm. To say but that they are spending the money that needs to be done. There's a woman who will in take the, the fish. Before a project there's, a like money, that there's a woman who will take money from the husband to buy fish and cook. And when she puts the food on the table, the husband doesn't find fish. You know the explanation the woman offered? She was taught to blend fish to cook. So she will blend the fish and cook. You won't physically see the fish. But, it's inside. but the person was eating, the woman was eating the fish secretly. <laughs> MPP will be quick, and this letter has come to tell her that, oh, they were supposed to do A, B, C, D, plus the construction of a camp. Was that our ultimate objective? As we speak now, the contractor is not on site. The contractor is out of the place. What is the commitment? The commitment was for us to execute the project within a particular time period. The contractor is out. Are we meeting that obligation? Right. Are we meeting the standards? Okay. So, and I'm worried that my own brother... Dr. Mahmoud Bahumia sits at the core of the development of this country at this level. And the only thing he could have done for the people of Northeast region is to ensure that this dam is done. 
And yet, well, he says he will ensure that it is done. It's important. There are always, there are always being and when he becomes president, the MPP hasn't got anything sure done that in this country. Done. All their grammar and narrative is full of futuristic promises. All right, let, let me come to Bernard. Renew. Let me come to. Uh, I'm weeping internally. B Bernard Mona now <laughs> on on this. Uh, Bernard. <laughs> So, I mean, yes, yeah, Gida is giving the explanation. It, um, it, 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 it doesn't sit well Obligation. with Honorable yeah. here. Yeah. What about you? Your manifesto, do you yes. Are you satisfied? Yes. Right? <laughs> Gentlemen, please, Bernard has the floor to speak now. First and foremost, Bernard. yes. First and foremost, I think that we look down upon people. His tasks have no increase. And this the opportunity. Been for too long. To now, you make promotion. life. Honorable Chinia, please allow Bernard to make his. Are you not getting promotion? When I come to your office, you can promote me. Honorable Chinia, please. When I come to your let, office, let, let's, you let's, let's, come let's, let's, let's allow the discussion to go on. I'll be in your office this afternoon. So too you many can distractions. Me. Whether uh, you are but, adding ropes or you are adding stars. <laughs> Bernard, please. When I get there. Let's hear what your submission is. Look, we identify a major problem. And that we. After identifying the problem, we propound a solution. In that solution, we know that the gulf of unemployment is huge. The majority of our young men and women, particularly from that black bracket, have taken to what we call headquarters, Kaya year, as a way to ensure the exodus of these young people into the cities that continue to cause problems for his ministry. We decided that the flooding that yearly comes along that path, we can harvest that water, use that water for all year farming purposes, and that our young people who have been trooping down south for greener pastures, will now have those pastures growing around us. Said that they will have something to do. Our people are not lazy. It's the absence of the opportunities so they can use their God-given energy and income, make life better for themselves and for their, 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 their generation. So government decided to get into power construction of China that we should partner to work on this dam. No doubt that successive governments have spoken about it. No doubt that the first president had a vision to construct it. And so, since 1966, that Kwame Nkrumah was overthrown, we are still talking about that dam. Now we are securing money to do the dam. And we have spent a colossal $12 million. How much is that in Ghana City? It's over 100 million Ghana cities. How much is that in Ghana City? That's about 150 million Ghana cities. Or billion. Million. We sit here and we are clapping that we have gone to do feasibility studies. We didn't know or we didn't do feasibility studies before we said we are going to do a dam. We didn't know that from independence that these are the things that we need to do in order to get a dam. So all the feasibilities have been done. The environmental social impact assessment has been done. So it is not a new or novel project that you come and tell me that you need to go and embark on this journey before you can construct. All the data is available. But because people want to chop it our money, they go and factor it as something that they need to do. So Probably, we can praise President Akufado for excavating a pit in Accra with so much money. In fact, what can we say about Palugu? We are going to construct a dam. The place, there is no dam. 
Then you come and tell us that we should clap for you because you have gone to put up a camp. Really? Camp. To do what? We want a dam. You say you are coming to give us a dam. We clap for you. The vice president comes to say that the biggest project and investment that the MPP has done is the Kualugu Dam. Now that attracted interest to go and see the Palugu Dam that the vice president is saying that that is the biggest investment in the Upper East region in particular and in general the North East region. Then they get that there is no dam. Then you come and tell me that Richard Opom Boating, who is head of the GIDA will now issue a statement explaining what? Is he not an appointee of President Akufado? Mm -hmm. Doesn't he take instructions from the vice president? So these concocted figures they have brought is what pleases Chinia. And not the absence of a dam that will ensure that our people are able to have a secured source of income. And but, but it's a process, and so it's part of the Which process. Which one is the process? It's a process. When was this dam supposed to be completed? Mm -hmm. When was this done supposed to be completed? And who didn't know which processes to take? People are still occupying their offices for non-performance. Why? Very well. Um, we'll, we'll have to wrap up on this matter. Yes, just a, just a minute a minute for you. you so see, that we move to our, our very final see, issue. My, my, my brothers up. are talking about Kaye and talk. Uh, when you have a problem, you will certainly have short-term solutions and long-term solutions. Mm -hmm. The fact that you have a lot of northerners drifting and moving from the north to the south, especially like Ryan Kumasi, you have to find a way of reducing the dangers that they are exposed to. Mm -hmm. But you also whilst, have to find a way to stop looking that at the long-term solutions, which is to develop or to close the development gap between the north and the south and make it attractive for them to be there. Mm -hmm. Now, this guy, my brother, the former regional minister, is talking about do you know that it was in their 2004 manifesto? It was in the NDC's 2004 manifesto. A hostel and for Kaya. A hostel for Kaya East, which they couldn't implement. Today he's sitting here condemning it and saying it is uh, symptoms. And, and your own manifesto in 2004, it was there. You won power in 2009. You couldn't implement it. But so more they couldn't implement oh, it because Benad, Benad. they realized that it was Benad. not an idea Benad. to do. And you decided Benad. that an idea not worth doing, you will come and implement Benad. it. I am saying that ah. there are problems you can find short-term solutions to. But there are some, you, you need both short and long-term. Right. Uh, create a balance between the north and the south cannot just be short-term solutions. So the, the, car, the, the hostels for them here is a short-term solution. Okay. But we are looking at the longer-term solution. Now, he also talks about uh, uh, giving explanation and all that. I mean, why, why are we not being honest and discussing the matters passionately us, especially the three of us, we are all from the north, and we are all concerned about the dam. And that is why I have not tried to play politics. But you see clearly that, I mean, if it is about accusation and, and commitment and obligations, they put it in their manifesto in 2012. President Muhammad put in his manifesto 2012 to construct the Kalubu Dam. After four years, they do it. Where is the commitment? Where is the obligation? I mean, don't let us go that line. Our concern now is some 11.9 million dollars has been spent that we are all wondering what it has been used for. Now, Ghana Irrigation Authority has come out with a statement to explain how the money has been used. It is for us to interrogate further and see whether we agree or not. I don't have a problem with that. Okay. But trying to talk about obligation and commitment as if the MPP is not responsible, the NDC, you promised it. You were regional minister right. of, well. of Northern Region. Well. They promised um, they they didn't execute. Yeah, you I mean, promised and just 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 I mean, a minute. I think, I think my, brother is, my, my, my brother is missing the point. I'm not missing the point. That if you talk about minister, I'm not missing the point. short term and long term, I am talking about the situation where we seem to be prioritizing the short term as against the long term. No, it's not, That's it's one. not the case. Secondly, if you talk about, I am saying that let us upscale and escalate our conversation around national development beyond explaining non-performance. Because if you look at the series of projects that I've mentioned, the JIDA, the PDS, the EJAPA, the whatever, all those things, when you catalog all of them, they all speak to a trend. They speak to a trend where government initiates such laudable projects and end up spending money and yet the project gets aborted.
The money goes down the drain and nothing happens. And I fear and I seriously dread that the Palugu Dam, based on what we have seen, is going to suffer the same fate mm. as the other projects that have already suffered. Look, okay. PDS and all, a lot of money has gone down the drain. And I am saying that the explanation that has been offered, if you go and look at the explanations in the letter, and you scrutinize it properly with the lens of proper governance, you are going to be asking questions about to what extent are standards met, to what extent have commitment been pursued, and to what extent are obligations being executed. Okay. And think... if you look at it, that, that letter, in my opinion, is rather pointing to many problems rather than offering... Okay, a satisfactory answer. I, I believe that moving let's forward, the like necessary steps will be taken to get happened? out of it. And what but, happened? Um, I have no problem. We have about 10 minutes more uh, to wrap up the discussion. Uh, so the uh, what um, former <laughs> uh, uh, President Mahama, who is flag bearer of the NDC, and uh, Dr. Mahmoud Bami, I mean, at the CEO's uh, summit, you know, and they were talking about the economy and what they would do about the economy and all of that. I mean, very, very recently, the MPP flag bearer is pointing to gold as the savior for the depreciating city, you know, among other things. Uh, ben Abona, I, I believe that you've, you've, you've followed those discussions and the banter between the former president and the vice president. Uh, I mean, in the next so a, four, four minutes or so, I just want to hear what your, what your, uh, your, your thoughts are on, are on that situation. First and foremost, just, just I think that we have ten minutes to wrap up. First and foremost, I think that it is good to honor persons and institutions that have performed to the admiration and to the benefit of our society. And so when there is a CEO's summit to be able to adjudge which CEO has performed, we should also be told what is the criteria for adjudging the best CEOs so that we will be able to follow that it is not somebody that has been able to dole out money, influence media by false publications, but that there are tangibles that we can match with the kind of um, citations and honor that we are giving to these people. In the instances that the CEOs are just mentioned, and we see only media publications, I have a problem because some of them have run their institutions aground. And it will not be long when you realize that those institutions, resources have been siphoned for personal, partisan, political campaigns rather than for the general good of the society. How do you say that those people are the best CEOs when indeed the record in their institutions suggests the opposite? So let's get to know what criteria we are using so that everyone will be able to match that these are the things, the values, the tangibles that we are looking for. That is one. The second important thing is, I find this whole thing that it's, it's a charade of the vice president and President Mahama. Both of them have had time and space to be in government. Both of them are responsible for the decline of the economy. Today, our vice president is saying that he's going to back our city to be strong with gold. Who's gold? Do we own gold in this country? All our gold mines have been sold. So what it means is that the vice president is now going to take our currency to go and buy gold and to come and use the gold to back our currency. Because we don't own gold. Gone are the days when we used to have the Pristia Bogosu gold mines. We used to have the uh, Akotia Consolidated Diamond Mines. We used to have the Obuasi Gold Fields. We used to have these gold mines that the state had special and majority interest. We don't have. You've auctioned it out. On the assumption that the private sector is better managers of, 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 of property. Now you are sitting down there waiting for royalties and tax revenues. And it is those royalties and tax revenues that you are going to use to back your currency. There is non-existent gold. If you want gold, you have to go and buy. So how are you going to back the strength of your currency with gold that you don't control? So it is like one of the whimsical thinkings. 
It's not tangible. You can't do it. In any case, at this material time, for the several years that we have run our individual country currencies, is it not time to begin to jettison the idea of running a Ghana currency, a Nigerian currency, a Sierra Leone currency? Is it not time? Well, there's a, there was a plan for that, but it's never material. I'm saying that, is it not time? The look, look, Kwame Nkrumah was a significant person. He realized that gathering the whole of Africa to say that we are forming a single currency will not. He started Ghana, Guinea, Mali. Remember, mm -hmm. that was the first union. And of course, it was not allowed to survive. Those three leaders were targeted and shredded. Today, we can do this thing without necessarily bringing everybody on board. That's the start. Even the European Union as it exists today, not all the European countries are within the European Union. And not all of them are using the, the euro. And then you know that your country is largely an import-driven country. You import everything, including some of these things that you are wearing. We import them secondhand. You import toothpicks secondhand. You import underwear secondhand. You import toothbrushes secondhand. The only thing you don't import secondhand is toilet paper. The reason is that the secondhand doesn't exist. So all these things, they add up to the look to build up imported inflation that depreciates your currency. If you come and tell me that you are going to back your currency with gold, are you going to, by that, stop the importation? The vulgar importation is largely responsible for what we are going through. And the fact that our currency is an isolation. So I find it very ridiculous when my mm. vice president comes to tell me that I'm going to back the currency with gold and that will be the beginning of the strengthening of the currency. The economics is not adding up. All right. Uh, but, but, but just to, you know, put this in context, let's listen to the vice president, al Haji Baumia, uh, talking about this particular uh, policy that he would want to implement when he becomes president. There is going to be a new law that will require that all responsibly mined gold has to be sold to the Bank of Ghana. All responsibly mined gold. And we are talking about, in the small scale sector, about 50 tons of gold. 50 tons. One third of the gold production in Ghana is just the small scale sector. Right? Now, if all of this is sold to the Bank of Ghana, that is generating $3 billion a year in gold. How much do we have to go and borrow from the IMF? $3 billion over three years. But I can get, we can get $3 billion a year in gold from, gold from the small-scale mining sector alone. Alone. That changes our balance of payments completely. Completely. This is every year you can get this. And it's there. It's being mined every year, taken out to India, to Dubai, and other places. So I want us, essentially, I made mention of this on February 7th, that ultimately my goal is that we are going to back our currency with gold. That is where we are, I want us to go, increasingly back our currency with gold because it is very easy for us to do so if you keep re having the gold reserves. And that will keep so that's the vice president you know, speaking about backing the, the, the currency with gold. I assume, Honorable, that you, you agree with the vice president it's that a, that is the way a, to it's go. A, it's a perfect, it's a perfect uh, proposition. True. Sure. Perfect, excellent proposition. Because what Bernard uh, didn't say is the fact that if you are buying, if Bank of Ghana is going to buy gold that is mined in Ghana with CD, it doesn't affect CD dollar relationship. It's, it's, you, are, you are rather getting the gold to <laughs> enhance the, 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 your, your, the, what is the foreign currency that you need mm. to purchase abroad. So it doesn't bring competition and, and, and when there is panic and when there is a uh, shortage of dollars in the system and then there is panic, people are, the CD begins to depreciate at a very high rate. So it is a very excellent proposition. We can now be looking at implementation.
Because sometimes we have good proposals, but when it comes to implementation, we fail ourselves. Mm -hmm. But for me, I think that the vice president had given an excellent proposition. And he has been saying this for long, that one of the reasons why our currency is, apart from the fact that we are not industrializing, one other issue that keeps affecting our local currency is the fact that our gold reserve is very low. Mm -hmm. So why are we not doing anything about it now? The, 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 Under, you know, the oil for Akufo gold, the oil for gold. I mean, I think from last year, I mean, government, our gold, gold reserves have... Yes, we have bought more gold. Our gold reserves have increased. But we need to do more. And your currency but, has depreciated. But the most important... <laughs> the most important point I want to make mm. is that I want to commend the former president and the vice president for both of them accepting to partake in the CEO summit. Mm. It's very important because if you want to be a leader, you have to subject yourself to pu public scrutiny. And these are the two main political parties, whether rain or shine, after 7 December 2024, one of them will be the president of Ghana. Mm. Bernard and Co are just... There's a presidential that, aspirant. Mm. No, no, they are, they, we are just going to carry them along. I see. We are going to carry them along. But the president of Ghana on 7th of January 2025... Could be Bernard Mona. No, it's not possible. You sit Lantam, down. I'm telling you that... Sit down with your impossibility. It's, it's, so, it's not possible. Sit down with your impossibility. Even your candidate uh, says uh, that it is possible, you are sitting down with impossibility. Dr. Mahmoud kind of, Bamiya kind of is the most is? likely next president. And in the unlikely event, which I doubt it doesn't happen, Mahama... <laughs> probably will be the next alternative. <laughs> As for Bernard, he's, he's not close at all. He's my brother. You think so? Oh, no, no, no. Okay. Uh, well, now, oh, I haven't even discussed You have finished. You I, thought you had, I thought oh. you were done. How? Okay, but so, so are you waiting for people me, to be so done I'm or you gave us two minutes? Oh, no, I'm, I'm and now he has exhausted his two minutes. He has one minute. He has a minute more. He has a minute more. more. I am saying that. Please, please, Lan. Your sense of time is very poor. Bernard, stop that. Don't be doing that to your younger brother. You must be pampering me and not doing what you are doing to me. At home. So, Honorable, please. so, so I'm saying point. that yes. I commend the two of them for accepting to be on the platform mm -hmm. and, and espousing their views, their uh, what is it, uh, vision and telling Ghanaians and the CEO Summit what they have done in the past and what they intend to do. And Bamiya was very clear. I mean, the policies that have been implemented by his, he and his boss in the last seven and a half years have brought a lot of development to Ghana in the area of education, health, employment, agriculture. He spoke a lot about these things. Uh, the former president also spoke about So it's all good. And now I was happy that uh, for, uh, Vice President Baumia has said that he will be happy to have similar platform with, with, with the mm -hmm. former president. Yeah, so, so that, perhaps we should be looking so at the presidential debate. But you see, uh, former president Mohammed um, is, is in the past, oh, long time. <laughs> we are looking at the future. Okay. And Baumia is the future. I mean, this is somebody Baumia. who who said that uh, I mean, you know, the get, dead goose syndrome. He doesn't care about what right. is happening. So, oh, he, oh, and this was at the time that let, he, let, he let wanted come to, to you come now, back. Abdullah. Now, so if he gets you have the final one, say on that he will never come back. The dead goose syndrome will increase. Don't <laughs> okay. forget. Um, uh, yes, Honorable Abdullah. Thank you so much. Yes. When I when I listen to MPP communicators, don't talk about MPP communicators. You talk about. I'm here with you. I'm here with you, and you have said something. You talk about what you want to say. So let me continue. Let me continue. Don't talk about MPP communicators. So when I listen to their communicators, and I also listen to what the president said, that he didn't want to hand over Ghana to John Muhammad because he's in the past, and that he will destroy his legacy. I came to the conclusion that my initial idea that the problem of the MPP was incompetence was incomplete. Their problem is incompetence and wickedness. In this, current, in this current economic hardship that Ghanaians are going through, no sane Ghanaian should wish Ghana to continue to be in this particular situation. And the only way we can change that situation is to actually listen to the two gentlemen who are vying to become the president. The former president and my brother, the vice president. And I want everybody listening to us this morning to pick one important lesson. That if you want the whole world currently, if you are looking for a model where public lectures and public pronouncements is an example of failure, Ghana is a model. Prior to 2016, nobody 
issued lectures on how to arrest the depreciation CD and to arrest the appreciating dollar more than my brother, the vice president, currently, who happens to be the chairman of the economic management team currently. For good seven years going into the eighth year, all the lectures that he ran across the country propounding theories as to how it could be done. Today, there's clear evidence. The macroeconomic indicators of this country give us ample evidence that public lectures and public pronouncement does not translate into effective governance and effective presidency. And therefore, Ghanaians, if you are listening to me this morning, and if you are serious about rescuing Ghana, let us move beyond listening to people who propound economic theories and you judge their competence based on how eloquent they are in the delivery of those economic theories. And there's one powerful example to tell you that the vice president's statement is only a textbook theory that he's talking about, but he doesn't know how to go about it. What has happened to gold for oil has happened to it. policy? The initiative they started, it was the same lecture about how useful gold is to our economy and how we can use the gold to be able to stabilize the CD and therefore that will, we should do it through the oil. What is the outcome? We are not, we are not uh, servicing our external debt and therefore our demand for the dollar is has not relatively true. It's gone not down. True. We it's are not. We are selling we, our multilateral debt. We it's are a, it's not. Our, it's, our, it's a we bilateral. We are not. No, NDC, you have been... You have please, been, my you friend, have when you were talking, you made a lot of mistakes. Right. No, 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 no. We are servicing our multilateral debt. We are not. Oriya Mochina, please, please allow him to finish. We are not. We are not. We are not. We are not. We know we are going through a debt exchange program with some of our external creditors. Exactly. That's what I'm simply trying to say. Yes, bilateral debt. That's what I'm simply trying to say. We are servicing our multilateral debt. Yes, that's what I'm simply trying to say. Yes. Welcome back to the show. This is GH Today here on GH1 TV. My name is Lily Mohammed. Uh, it's now time for House Matter. Uh, so one of our very own has joined us. And um, uh, there's a, the beautiful thing that will happen to him in the coming days. So it's beautiful that we talk about it. Our very own pastor, Alex Brown. Those of you who listen to Star FM uh, in the mornings, the voice you hear, yeah, that voice. He's here in the studio. Today you get to put a face to the voice on TV. And uh, he's Pastor Alex Brown, lead pastor for the Life Assembly. We also have been joined by Confidence Asari. She's head of publicity for the Life Assembly. And no, Confidence is a, is a he, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so when I saw the Jackie, Jackie Hansen Kofi is a member of the publicity team. Good morning, gentlemen and lady. Good, morning. Good, morning. Good to have you. Good to have the church in yeah, the studio. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for having us. <laughs> uh, yeah. Let me start off with you, uh, Pastor. How many years have you been in ministry? So, pastoring, I would say, officially, unofficially, mm -hmm. maybe about 20 years. How has it been so far? Yeah, about 20 years. It's, mm. been, it's been good. Mm. It's been everything put together. Mm. It's plenty of work. And that is why you must be called. Because there's plenty of work. If you want to do it well, there's mm. not anything that anybody should want to do. Unless God has called you. Mm. Yeah. But you know there are people yeah. who want to dedicate themselves to God. Yeah. Is, is, is that a challenge? If someone says, okay, I think that where I am in life, I think that I want to dedicate my entire life to service to God. It's a good thing. Well, the Bible actually says that he who desires... The work of a bishop is mm. a good work. Mm, mm, now, mm. Um, that is just one aspect of it. Mm -hmm. But the, the flip side is that it comes with plenty of work, persecution, challenges, trouble, and everything. Mm. At the same time, it's very good. Mm. I don't know how else we can describe it. Okay, so, so there's, there's, <laughs> there's something. There's a conversation I was having, I think, last week. Mm. And I was asking a friend of mine, why... Do we serve God? Mm. Why do we dedicate ourselves to God okay. and then are highly persecuted? We go through extreme challenges. Yeah. But he says, mm. Why am I struggling for that? For that <laughs> <laughs> Very interesting. So, this is it now. Um, God, after he made man, he put in place laws and systems to govern the earth. So Psalm 24 will tell you the earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof, the world, and they that are in. 
Now, this world is not just that. It operates by systems. There are mm. gateways. There are mountains of society. Let me give an example. Media is a mountain of society. It's a gateway of society. Now, that media is not God. Mm. But God made man. Yeah. So, if you want to be successful... You need to be in charge of one of the mountains of society mm-hmm, to be successful. Mm-hmm. So the media is one. The person who controls the media controls a lot of things, including money. So prayer is good. Service to God is great and all. It gives you the character, the ability to, to be successful at everything else. Mm. So God's word will tell you that you need to be trustworthy. You need to have integrity. You need to be hardworking. You need to be consistent and things like that now if we bring it to your work as a media personality once you imbibe all these principles you'll be successful money would come so serving god does not bring you money Mm. obeying and running his principles would definitely bring you money Mm. i wake up at 3 a.m i host a program on star fm star sanctuary from 4 to 6 by 6 30 i go and change and go to work now, speaking in tongues will not pay the bills. Absolutely. It will keep you energized. It will keep you activated very well. The man sitting there is a CEO of, of a fintech company. Mm. And he's serving God doing so well. And I say all the time in church. Mm-hmm. Service to God is great, but it will not pay the bills if you don't work the principles of God. Mm. So working the principles will bring the money. Doubtlessly, it will bring the cash if you work the principles. Mm. See... I'm listening to you. Yeah. If people don't <laughs> don't attend the life assembly, <laughs> <laughs> so on on ninth of June yeah. there will be an inauguration of yes. the life assembly, and you will yes. be ordained as yeah. well. Uh, yeah. Let's let's find out what is the life assembly confidence. Yes, thank you, Lily. So the life assembly is um, it's a gathering of 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 people who believe in, in, in the life that Jesus Christ has given to us and um, coming together to dispense it to um, fellow um, colleagues or, or humans around us. So mm. God is already doing his work. We are just a vessel that God has mm. found to as, as worthy additions to what he's already doing. And so we, we are thankful for the privilege and opportunity God has given to us. And we are praying that we would um, also execute the assignment that he's given to us in Oyarifa, where, where we are located. Okay, so it's a, it's a new church? It's a new church. It's a new church. Yes. Okay. Uh, but, uh, Pastor, why, why, why did you break away and, and go from... Is that something that you are forming yourself? All right, so let me let me explain that. I, I that initially people thought that the life assembly was another branch of the maker's house. Mm-hmm. No, it's not. I resigned from the maker's house and started the life assembly mm-hmm. after I had served for seven years. So this is an agenda that God, by His grace, mm-hmm. by the grace of God, and through very good people, uh, this man, for instance, um, he he walked to me one day and said, "God says I should I should be with you." And I was surprised. This was a time that we were just about six. Yeah. Mm. One, two, three, four, five, six. When did you start it? Your home? The life assembly. Yes. We started in the hotel. Oh. Yeah, in the hotel. Um, the, the first meeting, we, we rented microphones. So let me tell the full story. At the time I resigned from the maker's house, the church had bought an acre of land, prime land. We had everything that uh, uh, any pastor should be proud of. But the Lord said, leave. Your time is done. I had done seven years. So it was an express command from the Lord. Mm, mm. Off record, I could tell you things. But on, on air, mm-hmm. there are things you can't say. So it was God who asked me to leave. Mm-hmm. So we tended in our resignation. We handed over church property, mm-hmm. which I have videos of that. I took videos of the two Kia trucks, parking stuff and, and all that. So we left with our ten fingers <laughs> and our ten toes. We left. <laughs> and then later started the life assembly mm. from a hotel room. We rented microphones, rented everything. By the grace of God, and we have a beautiful space now. God has given us a beautiful space mm. and we don't have to rent anything again. Mm. Mm-hmm. God has been good. Anytime he gives a vision, he makes provision for that vision. Yes. So that's about it. It wasn't a breakaway no. 
it was, it was just God telling you it is time. Work is done. So I resigned and I, that service was interesting. Mm. I read my resignation letter in church. Oh. And I sent to headquarters that they should bring a new pastor to come and take over. And I left. Wow. At times, it's, it's, it's very expensive obeying God. Because mm-hmm. you look at what you're leaving behind, it doesn't make sense to leave. Mm, mm. Nobody in the right sense would want to leave a ministry that has procured... A, matu- a, a, a matured right. yes. ministry. Yes. And, and starts not even knowing where you're going, where you're going how, what how. is going to happen. Yeah, yeah. But they said the vision awaits an appointed time. time. Mm. Now, when that time is due, nothing can stop it. Mm. And by the grace of God, he has brought some very good people into our fold. We started from a hotel. Very expensive, but God paid the bills through very good people. And uh, today we are here. So on the 9th of June, Mm -hmm. we are inaugurating the Life Assembly. Just to make the statement that... uh, Mm -hmm. It's a serious matter. And then there would be an ordination and commissioning. And then other things that we do will come up. Mm. Other things like what, Jackie? Um, so we are looking at um, inaugurating the church. Mm-hmm. We are looking at ordinating the lead pastor, Pastor mm-hmm. Alex Brown, as the lead pastor of the church to take the church to where God wants to mm-hmm. take us to. Mm-hmm. And we are also looking to um, invite anyone at all. We are not um, a, a sect of people. We are not looking for a particular kind of people. Mm-hmm. So of come any all. race, come all, come one, come all. If you live in Oyarifa, Adenta, in its environs, we are looking, we are extending this if hand of in invitation. Hatches, if you live in Dome, anywhere. You live so, so she's a Hatcher champion. Like. <laughs> <laughs> okay. For those of us who live in Hatcher, Dome, Kilatu, Ashokman, and its environs, Paku, we are all invited You're to the all life invited assembly. To the life assembly. Okay. Yeah. So, and, uh, and, and she, she does voiceovers. Ah. Are you are you hearing that? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> 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 Take a second look at that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But let me just feed this information before mm-hmm. before you go to um, our brother confidence. Now, when I said the other things, mm-hmm. there are about five different things that I have been doing mm-hmm. for the last six seven years. Mm-hmm. Now we are bringing all of them under. The life assembly. Okay. To make it like composite and, and, and well structured. Number one, uh, I have a campus ministry that is in partnership with World Vision International, World Vision Ghana. Mm-hmm. We run trainings for university students. Okay. And it's been fantastic. Now it's going to be um, a wing of the mm, life assembly. A subset. We, yes, we have a prisons ministry. Okay. That we call uh, Abankukum. Mm-hmm. Abankukum. And we, we do that in partnership with some guys in the UK, um, US mm. and uh, Musdak Gas um, is a gas company that is supporting us greatly. And then we have um, our Proverbs 22, 6, day come for kids. Oh. Now, every August, last two years I was here, I spoke about it on GH1, yes. So that is also now coming under the, the life, life assembly. assembly. Making three, we have We Care. We Care Foundation in partnership with... Um, Save the Soul Foundation mm-hmm, last mm-hmm, year, mm-hmm, yes. Mm-hmm. You, you, you didn't come home? No, I was last year. I was ah, you're not around. around. Okay, that's fine, around. that's fine. Mm-hmm. So we care foundation. But this year, I'll, I'll, I'll be here. <laughs> you, are, you are the MC. <laughs> so this, all of these mm-hmm. are being brought under to make it look, um, not just look, but to let it be a composite figure. So mm-hmm. there is plenty of work to be done. Plenty of work to be done. Mm-hmm. So we invite you. Mm-hmm. Confidence. Why, why should I be there on 9th of June? You should be there on 9th of June because, like Pastor said, God is um, starting a new thing with Mm. with Life Assembly. Mm -hmm. And we think that, um, I mean, it's open to everyone. Come and experience life. Mm. Come and experience what God is doing with this group of young people who he has assigned to dispense life. Um, The fact that you are walking around with your two legs doesn't mean that you, you are living. Mm-hmm. Because we have people who are living but dead. Yeah. But if you have Jesus, if you have God with you and you understand what it takes to get closer to him, mm-hmm. then you have the proper life. Mm-hmm. And so be there, come and enjoy life, come and experience what it means to 
to have God on your side and to be on the side but of God. Especially for young people. I yes. think that there's a shift in the atmosphere yes. where a lot of young people are actually coming to God. Yes. Hitherto, you see them moving away. Yeah. Now yes. there's a shift. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Yeah. yes. Yeah. That's, that's correct. And so for us, we are happy because it's in the youthful, um, um, youthful brackets mm -hmm. that we have a lot of energy. And what better way to use your energy than to, to serve God right. and to bring people into the fold? It even makes you more purposeful in life. So for us, we are happy to welcome all the young people in Hacho, in all around. And, mm -hmm. and, and we, we know that God is going to do something mighty with, with the, 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 life the, assembly. the Life Assembly. Yeah. Okay, so on 9th of June at 4 p.m., we're all meeting at the Life Assembly at Oyarifa yes, for the ordination and inauguration of the Life Assembly. Congratulations to you, Pastor Thank Alex you. Brown. You. So I'll see you on the 9th of June. Sure. Sure. And thanks for coming. Uh, we'll take a quick break. When we return, there is a documentary by one of my colleagues. We talk about the maintenance culture here in Ghana. Stay tuned in. First of all, it is important to emphasize that I am not convinced that these hotels should be sold. These are hotels that are largely profitable serving the interests of workers. They were built by workers' contributions. Labadi Beach Hotel, for example, is the most profitable, one of Ghana's foremost five-star hotels. Only last year, they paid dividends of 25 million Ghana cities to the government. The year before, dividend of 10 million. I am told that it is very likely this year that they will be paying even much higher dividend. So why do you want to divest yourself of 60% the controlling stake in this hotel. Take another hotel in Cape Coast called the Ridge Royal Hotel. I have seen their books. Very profitable. Recently renovated. Even if you take the other hotels that are struggling now, it is because of bad management. A few days ago, I put out some internal memos how La Palme, for example, an acting manager, demanded $3,000 a month. So for six months, $18,000. I mean, how many successful conglomerates will even survive with this kind of management? So even for the hotels that appear to be struggling, it is because they have been poorly managed. It is because funds are being siphoned by a few nation records. And we must call it what it is. So when you have a pension fund manager who has been told by the ILO not too long ago that if you don't change your management practices, in a few years to come, you may not be able to pay pensioners. We all saw that report. We were alarmed. So why will you sell off your stake in such profitable ventures, particularly when we are discussing fixed assets in very prime location, we know the value of land, beachfront land, Labadi, La Palme, Elmina, hmm? Busia Lodge, Trust Lodge, Ridge Royal, these are fine locations, prime locations, the value of the land, always appreciating. I mean, I know of Smith Investments elsewhere, in other places, that are nowhere near the yields, the profits, the gains we are making from these hotels. So, fundamentally, I am opposed to the seal. So, I will still have been protesting if this seal I had discovered was going to somebody else. But what makes the whole transaction even more scandalous and makes me so livid, so outraged, is the fact that this is clear conflict of interest, clear insider dealing. People are sitting in cabinet, they have a great deal of information. There is no way these state assets, SNIT, and this board will take this decision without government approval, without cabinet approval. Absolutely no way. Then you have a cabinet minister who is privy to all of this information and who turns around to buy it. Now, the claim that the Honorable Brad Champong has made that 
he is a non-executive director, he is quite removed from this transaction, cannot be true. I have obtained the articles of incorporation of Rock City Hotel Limited. The Honorable Brand Champon is one of two directors. They have only two directors. And we know, Rock City Hotel, and we know that you need a minimum of two directors under a company's law for a board meeting to be legal and to stand and not to be now. At least these two must meet. Is he saying that they don't hold board meetings at Rock City and he's not part of them? Then it means that there was really no board resolution. Apart from that, he is a sole shareholder. And what makes it even worse, he's a sole beneficial owner. What that means is that when profit is declared, all of the profit goes to the Honorable Brad Champo. Nobody else. Nobody else shares the profit with the Honorable Brad Champo because you are the sole beneficial owner. So how can you therefore claim that you are removed from this? It shouldn't be made about you. You are separate from Rock City Hotel Limited. When you are Rock City, and Rock City is you, you are the sole beneficial owner. In any case, even the spurious claim that he is removed, he is not really interested in this transaction. I have a letter here from the chiefs at Edina Traditional Council. The Omahini of the Edina Traditional Area, Nana Kojo Kondia the Six, has virtually poo pooed that claim. He has exposed the Honorable Brachampo. In this petition directed to the Director General of SMIT and the Chief of Staff, Jubilee House, it states, Settlement of Golden Beach Resort, land at Elmina. And this is on the Dinner Traditional Council letterhead. You see Omahin's Palace. The letter states, It has come to the notice of the Dinner Traditional Council that the Golden Beach Resort, Elmina, has been offered for sale. This is when Honorable Brad Champong, Member of Parliament for Abitifi Constituency, visited the site with the investors. Our main concern is that the land on which the resort is situated is a property of the Dinner Traditional Council. We are therefore calling your attention so that we all could solve the matter amicably. Yours faithfully. And this is signed by Nana Kojo Kondria the Six. Omahini of Edina Traditional So this is Omahini saying that he saw Brian Achampong and investors coming there to carry out inspection. So, I mean, Wherein lies this claim from Donald Brad Champon that he's removed, he's not part of this. So again, you are seeing another falsity being exposed. Now, Honorable uh, Kujutua Blackwa, how specifically are you looking at this private member's bill operating? Yes, you say that you do want to make sure that there's public uh, consultation of some sort, and, and but specifically, how are you looking at the bill uh, operating, barring public officers from taking up any... Uh, assets, so to speak, public assets during their time in office, how exactly is the bill set to, op to operate? So, what we have discussed uh, amongst the team and amongst colleagues is that we should make sure that this bill is quite expansive so that it doesn't only cover politicians but their spouses, relatives and then politically uh, exposed persons associated with the politicians because we will really defeat our objective if it is uh, possible for somebody very close to the politician to go for the assets. I mean, it will just be the politician acting through his or her surrogates. We don't want that. So we want it to be expansive. So that, that's why we say politicians and politically exposed persons who are associated with that politician. Then we also want to make sure that the sanctions are severe. Then we also want to broaden state assets. So state assets will not just be bungalows or hotels, but it should include land. It should include cars. I mean, everything that is in the name of the state. I mean, we have seen instances where some people are leaving office and they even raid their homes. You know, virtually everything from chandeliers to carpets to... I mean, you remember some of the very bizarre instances we have had. So everything in the name of the state. 
your duty is to protect, preserve, take good care of them, manage it, keep it in good shape, not to annex it. And you see, the irony is that <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's so ridiculous. You hear these government officials say that this state asset is not good, it's not profitable, it's a drain on our books. It is even making SNIT unprofitable. Let's get rid of it. How they describe it with disdain and all of that, you would think that they would not go near that property even with a long fork. And they turn around and they are, look at how the, the Honorable Brad Champon is debating me all over the place. He's so keen on having these assets. I would have thought, I mean, how many weeks now since I raised this matter? I would have thought that he would have walked away long ago. He would have said that, oh, you Ghanaians, I was even doing you a favor. What is all this APRO, TUC, civil society organizations, academia, all of this hue and cry, this, you know, avalanche of criticism. I really was coming to do you a favor. As a snitch statement said, that they are inefficient, they need strategic investors. So... I was coming to do you a favor, um, Africa's best hotelier, if, if you people will not uh, uh, accept my bailout, then I'm leaving. But rather, there is such a vociferous defense, a very committed, spirited defense to turn around and own the properties they told us are no good. He recognizes that it is exactly. a profitable exactly. exactly. I mean, we are not zombies. God has given all of us brains. We see what is going on. That is why this private members bill is crucial. And I hope that we will get national support and that all of us will mount the needed pressure. I know that it may be a bit unpopular, uh, particularly among some politicians who think that this practice should continue, some who think that, look, others have had their turn. Uh, let the status quo anti remain so that we can also come and have our turn. No. I mean, what will be left? Do you if, think that you'll get the support from Nkrumah's era? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ministers, politicians were behaving like, what would have been left for us? We, the young ones who have just arrived. What, what, do you think we'll have met anything? So it has to stop. Do you think that uh, you will get it would get the support, really. I mean, from Ghanaians in general, yes, there has been public uh, outcry and outrage, so clearly a number of Ghanaians are not in support. But also within Parliament and your colleagues, do you find, do you anticipate that you'll get this uh, support for the, for the bill? I'm hoping to get the needed support. I'm hoping, but I'm not naive. Um, I'm not really oblivious of the fact that uh, I'm in recent times there has been extreme partisanship. Uh, some people may think that if they support this bill, then they are not showing solidarity to their uh, friend and colleague, the Honorable Brad Champon, which shouldn't be. We shouldn't be. Because, you see, often we have been criticized, politicians have been criticized, that we only criticize things that we are not benefiting. And that uh, we criticize because we are hoping that, I mean, uh, we will have the opportunity to repeat same in the future, which is wrong. It doesn't make us principal. It doesn't make us appear as people with integrity. I recall not too long ago, our friends in the MPP criticized the 31st December Women's Movement during the period of the Diversity Implementation Committee that they should not have bought in Sawam Canary because the founder of 31st December Women's Movement is Nana Kunedu Ajimarolins. We're all in this country. They said it was wrong because her husband was the president. Why is a group she has founded, the 31st December Women's Movement, being allowed to buy in Sawam Canary? There was a lot of hue and cry. I also recall that when the Bui Dam project was being constructed, at the time, I think the Honorable Asid Yunketia was general secretary. He was not even a minister, general secretary. And what he did was, they are building Bui Dam in my hometown. Let me set up a block factory because they will need blocks so that they can, if they need blocks, they will buy it from my company. The MPP held a press conference. There were several agitations. An MPP youth group even went to Shiraj and said that, that was conflict of interest. Why is he trying to take advantage of that project? So, look at these examples. 
And what has changed? That is why I'm saying that. I don't want these things to continue. And I don't want people to think that I'm only criticizing this because it is somebody by name who is not from my party. So I want this practice to stop. And I've been on this for the past 16 years with the Honorable Jacob H. Abilante's Bangalore issue. I think that we cannot continue on this trajectory. It's giving all of us a bad name. And you see, some colleagues are not paying attention to the opprobrium which is building up. Welcome back to the show. This is GH Today here on GH1 TV. So that was hard talk with Natalie Fort and the Member of Parliament for North Tong, Samuel Okujeto Ablakwa. Uh, she's in the studio and we get to see a beautiful documentary that she's done on Ghana's maintenance culture. That's all the things she saw first. Uh, Natalie, good morning. Good morning, Lenny. It's good, good to, to have be you. in the <laughs> studio with you. I know. <laughs> Very early, starting my day off as early as you do. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome yeah. to the culture. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> now let's talk about real right, culture absolutely. in Ghana. Yeah. Uh, you've done a story on Unkept. Uh, yeah. It's a documentary, and we're premiering it today uh, yeah. in subsequent belts. But yeah. what are some of the things that you saw? Where and where did you visit? Right. Now, first of all, uh, it was very important for me to, to work on this documentary, yeah. just as an individual, of course, as a journalist, having recognized the, the, the poor maintenance culture that we have as a people. Yeah. Very disheartening, right? From big projects to small projects, observing that. Now, my main focus, if you'd recall, initially there was a... a, a on, on News Tonight, I spoke about the, the, the poor facility, specifically the Independence Square. Yeah. Subsequently, I, I also then had an editorial, delivered an editorial which put focus on the malfunctioning traffic lights. Mm -hmm. So the heart of the story is the Independent Square, mm -hmm. the Black Star Square. Now the purpose of that, although we did visit some other facilities, uh, namely Parliament House as well, now, yes, the entire edifice is not in poor state per se, but there's a very large uh, fountain that, if it were working, it would be absolutely beautiful. And it's been, it's not been, been working for, for years, you mm -hmm. know. And so that, those were the main places that we visited. Now, with the Independence Square, I mean, of course, as we know, we, we are the first African country to gain independence. The square, having been there and read on the history of it, is really meant to, to symbolize this, this independence that we gained and create a sense of pride amongst Ghanaians. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely disheartening, I mean, to find that this square put up under the auspices of Osajifu Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. First of all, so you've got little fences uh, around the, mm -hmm, the facility. Mm -hmm broken down, I mean chipped off, the grass overgrown, the, the, the two gates, which of course have strong symbolism as well, one of them just flung open, not even able to, to properly close. Mm. I mean, that's how bad it is. The seats, which many of us have seen, are the colors of, of the Ghana flag. The seats are, are no longer there as they previously were. We've got hawkers as well uh, selling, really, within, within the facility from sachet water to drinks, what have you. Just people taking a rest on, on the seats that are supposed to be used during public functions. Mm. It's disheartening, really. And uh, I mean, I, I remember that I quite recall that, that I had a friend uh, visit the country for three days and was so excited to go have a look at the facility. She was absolutely uh, underwhelmed mm. at, at the state of the facility. She was absolutely underwhelmed at the state of the facility. So that's the heart of it. And then taking it further from public facilities to also looking at public goods, so on my second editorial on News Tonight, I spoke about the fact that many of our traffic lights are malfunctioning. Now, the key traffic lights that I put focus on was that at the, just not too far away from us, at the Jubilee House. For many months, that wasn't working. And when I'm coming over to the office, major it's a major intersection, right? You'd imagine that it should be working. It wasn't working. And you can see that it has that it can easily cause an accident and unfortunately. And we it have did. actually recorded a number of accidents. We have. Yeah. We have. And and during that period of that editorial, there was an accident re recorded. Thankfully no life was lost, but there was a very dire accident recorded. And so, yes, shortly after, we found that the, the traffic light there is, is working. When I posted it on my social media, this editorial, I got a barrage of messages from, from people as per traffic lights in their communities that aren't working either. And you could just, I could just tell from ordinary Guineans saying, kindly, uh, you know, put your focus on, on this area. Traffic lights here yeah, haven't been working for ages. Is it really affecting us, this intersection? It shouldn't have to get that far, right? We shouldn't have to to have Ghanaians cry out for, for goods that our taxes are, are meant to put in place, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. 
And I think it's disheartening. It's a problem, and and it's it's a dent on our character as a as people mm -hmm. from Ghana, and it shouldn't continue. Mm. Yeah. Let's take a quick look at this documentary, and then we'll have further conversations on it. The African is ready to fight his own battle and show that after all, the black man is capable of managing his own affairs. In Ghana, it is widely recognized that there is a significant issue with maintaining public facilities. Many traffic lights across the country aren't functioning. Some street lights have been out for months. The excitement of inaugurating new facilities is often short-lived, and maintaining them proves to be a challenge for those in charge. The lack of maintenance culture is costing Ghana significant amounts of money that could be used for development projects. One glaring example is the Independent Square, a major landmark in Accra. Established in 1961 by Ghana's first president, Osajifo Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, it symbolizes the nation's victory and independence. As the first African country to gain independence, Ghana's Black Star Square served as an inspiration for other countries on the African continent, seeking independence from European colonial rule. To put this in perspective, the Independent Square is to Ghana what the Arc de Triomphe is to France or the Statue of Liberty is to the United States of America. The difference, however, maintenance. Fast forward, 63 years after its establishment, the once enviable edifice leaves much to be desired. The fence has collapsed, showing years of neglect. It's clear that timely maintenance was not a priority for those responsible. A 73-year-old educator recalls the nostalgic memories of visiting the square as a child. She fondly remembers the Soul to Soul Festival held there on March 6, 1971, which brought top musicians from the United States to Ghana for a 15-hour celebration. Joshua. The Black Star Square, with its 30,000 seat capacity and iconic design, has stood as a symbol of national pride. But for Professor Vladimir Entridanso, who remembers its glory days, the current state is disappointing. When we say Ghana was the torch bearer of Africa's independence, then that torch was symbolized in the Independence Arc at the that's why Black Star Square. It was a place you felt the soul of Ghana was. Now the surroundings are such that it's uh, bushy and beyond it we hear people defecate uh, towards the beach. Uh, it's, it's an eyesore. Honestly speaking, when we were young, we really cherished this place. You were passing through the place and you could feel Ghana. You feel some kind of belongingness. Today, the place is so ordinary. Uh, it's been renamed Independence Square. How do we feel our independence when we are passing through this, this place? Chief Executive Officer of the Ghana Tourism Authority, Akwesi Ajaman, attributes the poor state of the Black Star Square to the many stakeholders involved in the maintenance and management process. These facilities don't necessarily fall under the Ghana Tourism Authority's um, ambit. I mean, there are several state institutions that also have interest. It's not um, entirely correct to say that these facilities have been left. There's, there are processes that you have to go through, and there are rules and regulations that you have to follow. So clearly, I mean, some of these things will take time. You have to advertise, you have to, even if you're going to go through some level of restrictive tendering, there are processes that you have to follow. So. I mean, like, just like you, we've been worried. 
he stresses that the Independent Square will see a facelift before the end of 2024 and notes are the historical and tourism sites in the country are also earmarked for renovation and refurbishment. What we did was to provide some justification for some partnership. And National Security understood that, okay, in the times that we are in, I mean, I think it's time for us to open up these facilities, be renovated, and then work going on. So going forward, what we are going to have is to have trained and certified tour guides and site guides on site so that when you come, they will take you around based on the history and what you're going to see. So it's going to be serving a dual purpose, I mean, for the Independence Square, open to the public for tours, but then also for national events and also for rental to um, organizations. Another historic facility Ghana boasts of is the Parliament House, established in 1965. The lawmaking house of the land was also built under the leadership of Pan-Africanist Osajifo Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. On the facility sits a majestic fountain, carefully designed to accentuate the eclectic architectural style of the building. But even more important than the aesthetic benefits it provides, the flow of water releases cool air and mitigates noise, bringing a much needed calming effect to the Supreme Forum, noted for the ventilation of grievances aimed at seeking redress. Today, these stately fountains are but dry structures. This fountain, which is one of two 